Okay, so um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to number five of the Heavy Nova and the New City Radio webcast. And today, my special guest is John Porcelli from Youth of Today, Judge, um, Project X, Shelter, and numerous other side project bands uh, that he played with, including like Gorilla Biscuits and Bold. And he's also a uh, yoga teacher, and his uh, spiritual name is Paramananda Das. And we'll probably go into quite a bit of that as well. And um, first of all, I just want to say that it's a real pleasure having you here because my own personal story with um, getting into New York hardcore um, is pretty, uh, pretty, pretty personal for me um, because when I was a kid, um, I think I was 16 years old, I got kicked out of school and my grandparents, I was living with my grandparents at the time and my grandparents just had enough of me. And uh, they just didn't know what to do. And so they sent me off to my aunt and uncle who lived in California in San Ramon. And um, the high school that I was going to there, I got involved with kind of like the new wave crowd, you know, and punk rockers and stuff like that. Because before I was like a total metalhead and stuff, you know. And um, my friend Kurt Dittmer introduced me to Youth of Today. And so that was my first introduction to New York Hardcore. Um, I had known about bands like Black Flag and stuff like that, but I'd never known anything about New York hardcore. And so um, getting into Youth of Today, it, um, it really changed my life. It really, really changed my life. It gave me like a whole different perspective on life. It gave me a whole different perspective on like positivity and believing in yourself and um you know staying focused and just it really helped me survive that like whole new beginning of going into uh uh a whole new life you know because i was totally lost completely lost in life and so ever since i was a kid i had always um you know wondered in my life if i was ever going to cross paths with you at a show or be able just to say, you know, thanks for being a guitar player and thanks for having the band. And uh, turns out that you guys came here to Germany with the uh, Judge 25th anniversary tour. And I don't know if you remember this, but I had my son with me and I walked up to you after the show and I asked you to go get Mike so that you guys could sign my son's hat random little thing i don't know if you what was it in berlin that's no it wasn't says. in berlin it was in northern Westphalia. it was in um i can't remember where it was munching gladback or something like that i think it was probably says on the back of my shirt you know <laughs> actually mm -hmm. but um uh yeah but then i ended up running into you there and that was a real special time for me because i was actually able to introduce my son who was a little child at the time you know and um uh, that was really super cool for me because I was able to introduce him to something that really changed my life um, for the better. And um, from the time between that, um, when I left California, you know, I had a really, really rough time, you know, fell back into doing bad shit and just leading a shitty life and uh, making bad choices and uh, horrible mistakes in life and graduated college and totally fucked up everything. But the one thing that always stuck with me the whole entire time and that was always there with me throughout my whole life was youth of today, judge and shelter. And um, it just, uh, it's a really cool thing that I'm sitting here talking to you and being able to express my gratitude for you guys existing and being on the planet, you know, a little bit, my little fanboy expression there. So, well, I tell you, you know, I'm, I'm totally honored and I actually hear, you know, it's amazing to me because I hear that a lot, you know, kids will come up to me. Oh my God, you today, 
changed my life. I was in a dark place. I was in a bad place. And, you know, to me, it really speaks of the power of change. Mm, yeah. Because most people think this. Most people, you know, I was just talking with some of my yoga students about this the other day in my yoga class. You know, most people think this. I look out at the world. I see all this bad you know, stuff happening in the world. I see all this corruption. I see this. I see that. I can't stand it. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to protest against that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. I'm going to like, you know, it's out there. The problem is out there and I'm going to go out there and I'm going to like, you know, you know, mix around the world and I'm going to change it. That has its place. But the most powerful thing and the, and the thing that changes the world more than anything is when it's not so much where your focus is, there's broken things out there and I'm gonna change it. When you turn the focus on yourself and you're like, you know, there's broken things in here and I'm gonna change that. And then you start to go, you know, through that really hard, pro you know, to go out, protest, picket, whatever, throw rocks, start fires, <laughs> you know, um, get a mohawk and, you know, get an anarchy a tattoo that's easy yeah, you know, sure, that, stuff right. is, that stuff is all easy the real hard work is working on yourself you know so it was a real we didn't even know it but you know it was a real um it was a it was a real kind of like experiment in in change because here we were we were just we were just like kids i mean me and capo we were literally teenagers you know everybody in the band yeah but somehow or other, I don't know where it came from, somehow or other, we had this kind of like burning desire for self-improvement. <laughs> I don't know where a bunch of 17-year-old kids got this from. Mm. But we were like, you know, we want to make ourselves better. We don't want to drink. We don't want to do drugs. I mean, look at this. Look at the scene around us. It's crumbling with heroin and, you know, uh, you know, whatever that, you know, the drug, you know, of the day is. Yeah, it was pretty so, bad. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was bad. Especially in New York, it was really bad. I mean, you can imagine New York City where you, where you can go to any street corner and get any drug you want. You know, it's like ridiculous. Drugs are like water in New York City. At least it was. At least it was back then. You know, yeah, on the right side. I've been watching a lot of YouTube lately about uh, just guys going around on the street and filming everywhere, and this it's just it's it makes me cry. You know, because I'm over in Germany, and so we have a social system, and so. There's um, there's a lot more help for drug addicts and there's a lot more help for alcoholics and mental people with mental illness. And so we don't have a lot of that street life um, it's here in Nordrhein Westphalia, where I am. Um, I'm, I'm in Dusseldorf near Cologne. And so mm -hmm. places like Berlin, sure, of course, you're going to see a lot of street life and you're going to to see a lot of drug deals and stuff like that on the street. But here it's really not. Um, it's, it's really not visible, you know, and I've been watching a lot of stuff from the States right now. And, uh, and uh, it seems like it's, uh, it's getting bad again, you know, because I see terrible videos, man, that just make me want to cry. And so, yeah, you know, it would, uh, you know, um, when, uh, well, so, anyway, yeah, let, me, let, yeah, let me, let me, let me just make, let me just make this point. So, you know, we had this idea that we wanted to kind of, that, we wanted to change ourselves, basically. We yeah. weren't going to kind of be like that. We were going to not do drugs. We were going to not drink. We were going to take an active stand against it. You know, we were going to become vegetarian. We didn't like the way people were treating animals. We didn't want to take part in that. And so we just made kind of like little shifts in our life. And it was, you know, for us, it was it what really wanted to make us go out and take like a bold stand on it. Like, you know, had like you today did, it wasn't because, you know, whatever we're, tr we're trying to tell people what to do. It was sort of like a, a natural enthusiasm. Like, wow, you know, we just kind of stumbled into this clean living thing and it's great. Like, why wouldn't everybody want to live like this? You know, mm -hmm. why are people sitting in CBGB's bathroom, you know, shooting heroin into, you know, in between their toes. Like, what kind of life is that? That sucks. Right. You know, we were just, we just had this natural enthusiasm about shifts in our life that we made in our life that, that, that made a bit, a huge difference in our life. And I tell you, that's where the, um, that's where the power of change comes from because you don't have to go out. You don't have to like, pick it and vote and you know 
I mean, those things have their place. I'm not saying, you know, don't, you know, don't be an activist, but the most powerful way to change other people is when you change yourself and then you become like an example and a, and a beacon of, of, of light for other people. Exactly. And I tell you, I tell you, when, when people do that, I mean, look at youth today in our own little way, we just kind of made these changes in our life and people just got inspired because, you know, it wasn't so big in the scene at that time. And people were like, wow, look at what these kids are doing, you know, and they look healthy and they look, you know, you know, they look happy and, you know, their band's really good and the music's powerful. And, you know, it just sort of like lit a bit of a like underground, I mean, very underground, <laughs> you know, revolution, but. It was a big lesson to me because, you know, I could see that if you, you know, if you look out and you see things that you don't like in the world, the first thing you got to change is you got to get those things out of your own life. And when you do that, that's inspirational. And, you know, and I've been inspired by people that did that. It's, it's not like I came up with this stuff. I'm, you know, I looked at people like Ian Mackay and Kevin Seconds and, you know, just other people that I were that I was into, and you know, later on, you know, spiritual teachers that you know that I got into, and that's really, you know, history has shown that that's really how sweeping change takes place. Right. When a small pocket of people change themselves, that becomes a, the match that like that will light the fire in like thousands and thousands, even hundreds of thousands, millions of people. So, um, yeah, you know. If you want to, you know, to all kids out there, if there's any kids out there that are, that are, that are listening to this, you know, because kids are, you know, it's usually, you know, people that once they hit our, our age, they're pretty set in their ways and they're not going to change. Yeah. <laughs> it's the True. kids, it's, it's the youth that like, you know, look out in the world and they see the way that their previous generation did it. And they have this kind of like desire to do things differently to those kids, change yourself, change yourself first. Yep. And then watch the world around you change. Yep. And that's, you know, it's funny because I just like, I went through this with my son just recently. He's 17. And, you know, he went through his all his little experimental stage, you know, and, you know, we had a big brawl about it. He didn't talk to me for three months. And he's like, hey, you know, I got my new friends, you know, and fuck you. And, you know, and, and I was like, you know, remember that show I took you to, you know, when you were a kid, remember that guy? you know, and, the, and, and that went backstage and brought the singer out, you know, and signed your hat, you know, remember that shit, you know, remember what that hat said, you know, uh, you know, positive, man, you know, positive thinking, you know, and do you think that the shit you're doing right now is positive? And, um, you know, a few weeks ago, you know, he told me, he was like, you know, yeah, you know, dad, you're right, you know, and I quit doing all that shit, you know, and me and my girlfriend are doing great. And, uh, you know, I haven't touched beer anymore. I don't smoke weed anymore. And, um, and I was like, you know, fucking right on, you know. And I went through a very, very long period of time of, of very, very severe depression. And a few months ago, some friends of mine were just like, you know, Jared, you've got a real gift, you know, to like, you know, talk to people and you've got a real gift of expression. And, you know, why don't you start doing a, a podcast, you know? And I was like, well, I don't know what the, what I would do it about, you know? And so I just came to this conclusion that what I wanted to do with this podcast is I wanted to help my friends who have bands and who are artists and who are musicians. And I also wanted to get in touch with people that um, have been an influence in my life. And so, which brought me to writing you. Um, I also wrote, uh, I also wrote to Ray, but I haven't heard anything back, but I, he's a busy guy. And so he and is not, not only is he busy, he's so busy at right at this moment. I can't even get in touch with him. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's okay. That makes me feel better. Uh, and, uh, I just got, um, a message from Angela Moore from Fishbone and, um, it's possible that we're going to do one together. Um, they've been a real big inspiration in my life as well. Just, uh, you know, just the love that those guys put out in the world. It just, sometimes it makes me cry, you know, and, and he's, um, he, he's had, had his ups and downs too. He has. Yeah, he has. Yeah. And I uh, just saw on the internet that he, um, just released a new art show and, um, 
So hopefully he writes, hopefully, hopefully that one goes through because I'd really love to hear his story, you know, of, you know, falling and getting back up and, you know, the, the recent uh, recordings that they did for the Alice in Chains, um, man, that recording that they did of wood is just phenomenal. And so kind of just fell into that, like the last people that I've been talking to have all been musicians and friends of mine and whatnot. And uh, just talking about personal stories of, of change and, and kind of rebirth and keeping going, you know, and all that stuff. Um, what are some of the, like the most positive stories that like happened to you personally, like along the road where, because not everybody can stay up on a high, you know, were there points in life where you felt like, God, you know, um, what, what am I doing? You know, I mean, is this, you know, am I, what am I doing? You know? many times yeah what are what are, <laughs> what are some of the low points where you where you where you really just took um you know did you have to look back at your own music and your own life and just say like like hey man look what i've been doing and get, get back up you know what, you know how did you rise up you know what were some of the ways that you did self-change well you know i don't really have like a super dramatic bottoming out story or anything like that. You know, some people have like really, you know, they went to the depths of hell and back and it's yeah. like, you know, you could, you could make a movie out of it. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't really have one of those stories because I think like, you know, I went straight edge when I was, I think it was right before my 16th birthday. So around the time that I was 16, I didn't drink, I didn't do drugs. And, you know, that saves you from a lot of hell right there. Like that mm -hmm. one decision that you make, and it was a decision that, you know, I was very serious about. You know, as I looked around, you know, over the years, you know, my friends in high school and especially, you know, people in the punk scene, you just see that, you know, that one decision that I'm going to indulge in intoxication and drugs and it leads to some real bad stuff. And people go to like some real dark places. So luckily... You know, I, you know, I always say, you know, one of the best decisions I ever made was when I was just a kid, somehow or other, I had this inspiration just to, you know, have, you know, live my life in, in a clean way, especially when it came to drugs and booze and, you know, drinking and, you know, partying and, and like that. And I think that saved me from a lot of like really bad decisions and really bad roads my thing was, you know, you know, my kind of dark points were more, I don't know, existential, maybe like, what's life all about? Mm, right. <laughs> you know, what, what am I doing? Am I, am I going to play hardcore for the rest of my life? Uh, you, know, you know, really things like that. And uh, it, it was usually, a tra it was usually a transition points in my life where I really had to work hard to reinvent myself like you know probably the first time i did it you know was after youth today had broken up judge had broken up i was in gorilla biscuits and we were we were kind of doing phenomenal you know this was like you know in the early 90s and then walter was doing quicksand yeah and then walter walter broke up broke up gorilla biscuits to just do quicksand full time which was a great decision on his part quicksand was incredible yeah great and band yeah and really the whole scene was kind of moving into like more towards alternative rock in the nineties anyway. Right. So, uh, he did that. And then it was like, you know, it was at a point in my life where the hardcore scene in New York was getting really crazy. You know, people were shooting at each other. You know, I got jumped wow. and, you know, you know, beat up really bad by a bunch of skinheads because oh, I was wow. straight edge. Uh, -huh. uh so, you know, and plus I was at the, at the point where I was like, you know, 22 years old, you know, I wasn't like a kid anymore. Right. And I was like, you know, what's the next stage of my life going to look like? Like, where do I want to, you know, where do I want, what do I want to kind of like move into? And that was really what, what sent me to joining shelter and becoming a, you know, a, getting into yoga and getting into spirituality and getting into Krishna and, you know, it's always those hard points and, and challenging points in your life. Like, even if I look back at my life, I can honestly look back at my life and say that those points that were like 
when I was really going through the dark night of the soul and really, you know, searching for something and, you know, one, you know, one door was closing on me. It was those points where I really moved my life in a much better, bigger direction. And, you know, that was one of them. That was when, when I was just like a young kid and I was becoming a man and I just had to kind of start to figure out life. And I thought it would be a good time to put on the brakes and decide what I really wanted to do in my life and what was really important to me. And that's when I really started getting into spirituality. Mm, interesting. Like that's when I, that's when I wasn't doing music. Um, I kind of put the brakes on that. You know, I wasn't in, I wasn't in a band and I was just like, you know, before I even move forward and do another band and go on tour for another three years, let me figure out what's really important to me, where I want to go. You know, sometimes people will, you know, sometimes people are, are very energetic and they're very, uh, you know, and they're very, um, you know, into kind of like succeeding and things like that. I was, I was always a type of kid like that too, but sometimes it's like, you know, you just got to figure out what wall to put the ladder against. You know what I mean? Because you could put the ladder against a, against the wrong wall and then you could spend years climbing up that ladder only to get yeah. to the top and be like, this is the wrong wall. Like, what am yeah. I doing? Yeah, I spent so, pretty much most of my life on the wrong ladder. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm a, I'm, I can attest to that uh, uh, 100%, you know. And, you know, funny enough is that uh, um, shelter, uh, perfection of desire, actually was the inspiration for me to look into Krishna consciousness. Um, I remember when I was living in Detroit and I picked up the cassette tape and um, I wrote to Ray, first time I'd ever attempted to write to like a rock star, you know, and um, he actually wrote me back on a piece of an envelope stuck into another envelope. And um, yeah, we answered every single piece of mail we got back then. And we would get a ton of mail, like a part of like a good two hours of our day would be, you know, individually answering people's mail that we got pretty when cool. I when I was a, when I was young you know and I was going through all those hard times you know that was something that was really important to me and I you know I cherished that for a long time and I had it um in a box that I left in my friend's garage in Detroit and uh ended up everything ended up getting destroyed because of snow damage and molded over and lost it and ended up losing all my old hardcore tapes and everything just all is totally destroyed and um, I still actually have the um, uh, the copy, the original copy of the Bhagavad Gita that the ashram in Detroit gave me when I uh, went to visit them. And um, I was seriously considering giving up like all material shit and just moving into the ashram. I think I was like, 20 and uh what are you you're, you're, what are you 49 50 i'm 54 54 okay it's, uh, well that was a little gift for you 40 49 50 there you, go. you look you look good um so you know because i was living in my mom's attic you know it was just a shithole and you know open rafters i was just looking at my life like you know what am I, how can I, how can I possibly continue to live like this? You know, I was driving a car that cost me $125. Uh, there was a hole in the floorboard with a piece of wood on it so that I, my feet wouldn't fall through like Barney Rubble, you know, Fred Flintstone. Sounds like some of our old vans. And it was just like, <laughs> it was a disaster, you know, and it was just, I was looking at my life, you know, and then I was like, I was in this, um, I was in a record shop, you know, and then like, I was talking to some guys and they were like, oh yeah, you know, uh, you know, if you like youth of today, you should check out the band um, Shelter, you know, and, and I, I brought it home and started reading the lyrics. And I was like, cause I had kind of some kind of a, you know, interest in spirituality, but I'd never really followed it. And I was like really ready at that time. And just something, I don't know what it was, but I was afraid of leaving my mom's place. And I was afraid of leaving my family. I was afraid of giving up all of that security. And I was just like, you know, and looking back, I kind of regret that I didn't do it because I, th I think that the experience probably would have 
saved my life because not, not really saved my life, but would have been a much different life because I was 20. I hadn't fucked. I hadn't really fucked up yet. And looking back, you know, uh, I know it's not good to look back and it's not good to look in hindsight, you know, it's better to stay in the now, but um, yeah, I credit, I credit shelter for a lot, probably the main impetus of my spirituality today. And so, oh, great. yeah, absolutely. Because ever since I, ever since I got into shelter, I've studied uh, Krishna's consciousness ever since. And I've studied world religion. I ended up, when I moved to California two years later, I ended up going to college and studying world religion, philosophy, human sexuality. Um, I made a, the best attempt I could at going to college to get a humanities degree. And um, yes, yeah, so that was a pretty big influence on me, you know? And I still have my altar here at home. I still do my, you know, yoga every week. I still do uh, chants every week and I still do prayers, you know, when I can find the time and when I, you know, when I've got it on my mind. And, you, should, uh, you, you, you should take my yoga class. I teach every day. Whew, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not that far ahead. I don't know if I could, uh, I don't know if I could hang. I'm uh, pretty basic, you know, I do it once a week. That's it. You know, it's like, I, yeah, and uh -huh. that I, I start getting really, uh, um, sore after just one because i no, be completely honest with you i really i led a life of just like debauchery and it um this uh last six months of my life have been a massive 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 change and i made a real decision in my life that from now on i was just going to lead a life of positivity and love and spiritual and just you know try to promote the best life and the best person that I can because uh, you know my mistakes in my life kind of led me to the point where I had to make the decision you know um so so going back a little bit you know um you can't escape uh doing a little bit of interview stuff um mm -hmm. going back uh you were a kid and uh your first um at least from what I can do as far as research and whatnot uh young republicans would you consider yourself still conservative today or were you conservative no. then what was the whole backstory behind being called the young republicans it, w it was a joke because we hated Yo republicans oh. okay <laughs> all right okay you all know right. it was it, you know there there were it wasn't in our high school but i think on uh God, what was that show show with michael j fox Remember that show? Oh, Family Ties. Yeah, Family Ties. In in his school, he was part of the Young Republicans. Remember that okay. was his whole thing. He was like this little conservative kid. Yeah, right. So, uh, so we took it from that because we were the exact opposite. We were a bunch of like, you know, fifteen, fifteen year old, you know, crazy punk rockers. So okay. It was, so it was like an ironic name. We were okay because the, the the reason I asked. As a the question, matter of fact. As a matter of fact, enemy number one when I was 15 was Ronald Reagan. <laughs> it was everybody. Yeah, it was everybody. Um, that's why I wanted to ask the question because, you know, you've always talked about, you know, as like the impetus for starting Youth of Today was like to be better men and to be, you know, better people and just to lead cleaner lives and whatnot. And I'd always went and I'd always wondered if at the time, if it was uh, um, that you guys were actually conservative, you know, and so that clears up a question for me. Um I mean, we probably didn't even know. I mean, we were so not interested in politics. You know, we probably wouldn't even be able to articulate that stuff when we were 16 or 17. We were on a, just a total different kind of personal trip. Okay, right on. Um, so then you go on and then you do uh, Violent Children. How long did that last? It lasts about a year. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you know, I was in that band, Young Republicans, and, you know, we all, we were all part of the same scene. You know, there's a there's a club in in Stanford, Connecticut called the Anthrax, and it was really, it was a super inspiring place because here was this tiny club that was in the basement of an art gallery, and every single big punk band played there. But I think it was because it was in between New York and Boston, and so when bands were on tour, they could just easily like pick up a show in Connecticut, you know, on their way to Boston. So 
you know, I saw the descendants, you know, circle jerks, the Dickies, um, youth brigade, um, seven seconds, uh, you know, black flag played there. Uh, all the New York hardcore bands played there, you know, like the abuse urban waste. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. It's um, iconic. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, I, I would say just as iconic, you know, for at least for us in the hardcore scene as CBGBs, you know, and it was like, it was like Connecticut CBGBs. For yeah. Sure. It's, it's pretty fucking iconic. Yeah. And what, um, what was, what was cool about it was, um, it was just a bunch of kids. Mm. Like, I think the guy that ran it was like 20. And we thought he was like old because we were all 15 and 16. But, you know, 20 is like you're a kid when you're 20. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was like, it was really cool. Here's this club run by kids, four kids with a bunch of like bands that are playing that are practically kids. You know what I mean? And so we were all just part of that scene. And, you know, so when Violent Children needed a guitar player, you know, I was really good friends with, with Ray. And so I, I joined that band and we did that band for a year. And, you know, when we graduated, we did Youth of Today. Okay. Not knowing, not knowing it was going to turn into what it turned into, like this whole life changing thing for us. Okay. So um, there was a little bit of, there was, so when I was doing some research, uh, there was a little bit of conflicting uh, information because um, for some reason, your name came up with some kind of an association to Inside Out, but you're not credited for being with Inside Out. What's the deal with that? Did you and Zach, were, were you guys, what's the whole story behind that? Why, why is there con conflicting story on the internet? It says there was no, nothing released and then says that you and Zach were writing music together. And, but then when I, you know, when you look up like who's the backstory of Inside Out, you're not a, even mentioned anything in it so what's the why is there an internet conflict of story there i was i was never in inside out we met zach way before he did inside out like when youth today was first playing california zach was always like you know he was in that he was in a band called hard stance yeah and, and he was just one of those kids that would just like you know youth today would play and he would do a thousand stage dives during our set yeah, that sounds like <laughs> so, me. You know, so, yeah. So we're like, there's this crazy kid doing all the stage dives, and we just kind of like met him. He was um he was friends with those with this crew of kids called the Sloth Crew out in California. So we hung out with them, we were friends with them. And I had moved to California in the early 90s to work for Revelation. Um and that's when I started to, you know, hang out with Zach more. We were I, I think the thing was is that we were briefly gonna start a band. We had plans that we were going to start a band and he was going to sing and I was going to play guitar. But the band actually never happened because he was working on Rage Against the Machine and Rage Against the Machine really blew up. Okay, because it's weird. The the internet, the way that they write it was that uh, you were in a band with him and that he suggested, let's call it Rage Against the Machine. And you were like, yeah, no. He did. He did. You know? <laughs> and so, yeah, but it ended up turning like it, it was a, turned into a song or something like that, didn't it? At the... I can't remember the history of it all. Um, well, Ray, okay. yeah, I don't, I, I'm not really sure. I mean, the, nothing really happened with the band. We got together maybe like two times and we kind of jammed out a little bit, but it never really okay. got off the ground where we were a full band practicing. It was, just, it was more of an idea, but um, yeah, he was working on, you know, he was like, he was working on this other band and we found out that it was like a rap band or something. We used to make fun of him mercilessly. Like, hey, how's your rap band going? Yo, MC Zach, what's up? And, you know, he would just kind of like, he just took it and like, you know. Take it with no, stride. It so, yeah. It was sort of a, it was sort of like a mysterious thing because none of those other guys were from the hardcore scene. So he used to like go to LA and practice with this other band and we didn't know if it was going to be a rap band or whatever. And then when Rage Against the Machine came out, I mean, they were just so good. And we were all just like, oh, my God, this is Zach's rap band. This band is incredible. <laughs> I, saw their I saw their first show. I saw the first show they ever played. They played wow. a house party, house party in OC. Okay, wow. And even at that very first show, they played practically every, every single song from that first record. And they were just incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a pretty iconic uh, on the internet these days, you know. And just like, um, just like the uh, 
the old t-shirts and posters and stuff like that and record covers from violent children there's like this like kind of resurgence you know of like young kids that are finding out about hardcore and they're bringing all that stuff up and and i'm constantly seeing like a new post you know violent children and i'm like wow man that's so long ago man it's like all of a sudden new kids are just finding out about this stuff you know um okay so that clears that up that clears that story up because the, the way the internet led you know kind of uh, writes it out is that it was like almost a thing you know um okay cool so um so then uh you guys start so we already got the backstory kind of of like youth of today and like what you're doing with youth of today and um how far like youth of today broke up completely or did you could start with judge while you were still in youth of today Youth of, I, Today broke, Youth of Today broke up briefly. Because I watched that thing on Noisy, that Noisy thing that they did with Mike Judge. And there was like, there yeah. was a little bit of interview with you in there. And like you had, there was a little bit of a backstory, but not much. Yeah, Youth of Today briefly broke up. I think it was like around 1988. We only broke up for maybe like six months. Um, that's why we wrote, the, we, we wrote We're Not In This Alone. And then the you know that song flame still burns it has we're back yeah because we had because we had broken up and uh yeah it was in that time that in that six months that usually it was broken up that we that we wrote and recorded that first judge record the single new york crew when that record uh that was the second my friend kurt when i was in high school who i told you about before he gave me two records and uh, no actually he gave me three uh on on cassette tape that he recorded and it was uh, Break Down the Walls, New York Crew, and uh, Speak Out. And um, New York Crew, like, I was like, okay, I'm going to, I this Youth of Today thing, that's pretty cool. And like, Speak Out, that's pretty cool. But dude, it was like, New York Crew just spoke to me somehow. It was like, that was my, Youth of Today was my introduction. But then New York Crew, it just, something just clicked. It was like a light switch, you know? It was, a, just, good, it, it was a good record. <laughs> and it just like, it just completely, and then when Bringing It Down came out, that was like, I pretty much said to myself at that point, I said, you know, if there are other hardcore bands out there, I don't even want to hear them. I don't even care what it is. I, I really, this is like, this is like the tape that I want to listen to literally for like the rest of my life. <laughs> I, I just was like, you know, I had all my Metallica records and all that stuff. And it, but I just wasn't ever listening to any of them. It was bring it down was in my Walkman, literally from the time I woke up in the morning when I walked to school and when I was on at lunch and when I walked home from school, it was the tape that was in my Walkman. And it just, it, it, it resonated with me in such a way that nobody had said the things that were going on in my mind, the way that Mike wrote it down and the way that he put it out. And especially with the power that he was as a, uh, as a, as a vocalist, it just, it just resonated with me. And the difference between your guitar playing in Judge as opposed to Youth of Today, um, it just, it, it hit me so much. It's just that, that those riffs were just, uh, when I, when I, when, when the first time I hit, the, I heard the storm, I was just like, fuck. I was like, you get any, it, whoever, if you're in a band, just, forget it quit your band because you'll never be like this you know um yeah, I don't that, know if that, 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 that opening was good i don't know it if that good. uh you know is um uh, embarrassing to hear or anything you know but uh, i'm sure that hundreds of kids have already told you that you know well well you want to know what's cool that's the magic of music it's like you know here you ha you know there's something there's something magical about music where somehow or other it just goes straight to your heart like i don't know what it is like if you just had like poetry night and mike judge got up and he just read those lyrics as poetry it wouldn't hit you as hard and there's something just about music you encase something in music and it just bypasses everything and it just goes like right into your heart 
And I tell you, when you, you know, that the magic of music is this, like when you listen to a song and you're like, wow, that's exactly what's going on in my own head. And this guy has articulated it even better than I could. Like, what an incredible song. And it's like, you know, even for, you know, I, I love music. You know, I'm a huge music fan, you know, you know, obviously, even when I was like a little kid, I was like obsessed with music. It's weird to me when I meet people these days, I'm like, what kind of music do you like? And they're like, I don't know. I'm not really that into music. I'm like, what? what? Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like we can't be friends. Right. <laughs> I have, you know? I've got a huge vinyl collection. I've got a huge uh, CD collection. I've got like 2,500 vinyl. I've got thousand CDs, um, thousand cassette tapes, you know, and just ridiculous. And I'm the same way. If people say, oh, I don't really listen to music much. I just like, I can't copy it, man. I just like, how, yeah. how, how do you live your life? You know? Yeah. You know, so th there's that moment where, and you know, there's, there's some great comfort in that because when you're going through struggles, you know, usually you isolate yourself. You feel isolated. You feel like no one understands you. And then bam, you hear this song and you're like, I'm not alone. Like other people have this and they're going through it. And, you know, if you, especially when you watch that documentary, you know, Judge was so different than Youth of Today. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, Youth of Today was just like this ball of energy and positivity and straight edge and make your life better. And, um, you know, Mike was a troubled dude. Like you watch that documentary and you understand he's coming from a totally different place it's a really fucking good documentary and it's really touching yeah and, and you know so uh, you know and and just like you said like how bringing it down hit hit you really hits you really hard i've heard that from so many people like you know they and they especially tell mike like you know, i was really struggling with life and i had all these problems i was in you know i was in a dark place and i heard that record and you know mike was in that place and that record is his testament of like I'm in this dark place. Like I feel alone and misunderstood and I don't know, you know, where to turn in life. And, you know, this record is like my diary of that. And, you know, you, and, and it's like that, that diary of his struggles and his challenges. And, and really it was like, what, what was the, what was the beauty of, of, of that record and, and kind of like what makes Mike judge such a, uh, such an incredible person it's like he was in that place but he was like you know what i want something better for my life like how do i get out of this and how can i climb myself out of this hole that i that i dug myself into and it was that sort of sincerity of 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 him in his own life it really came across on that record a lot of people identified it, and a lot of people found like a lot of inspiration and, and motivation from it Oh, but, I, I mean, I, I'm just so honored just like, you know, just being these bands that, you know, impacted people like so many bands that impacted me. I mean, where would I be in my life without Seven Seconds and, you know, Minor Threat and, you know, mm. bands like, even bands like, you know, Youth Brigade and even small bands like Antidote mm. um, and Agnostic Front, you know, those bands changed my life. Yeah. I, w I wouldn't be the person I am here today if it wasn't for those bands. So I, I can relate... You know, when people say that about me, I'm just like, man, I'm just paying it forward. So many, so much music and so many bands affected me in so many positive ways. I'm so glad that I could be, be a part of the chain, you know? That's cool, you know? And, uh, you know, you know, one of the things that really kind of broke my heart about that whole uh, documentary was that how, you know, like at the end when Judge broke up, how difficult it was for Mike to carry all that. You know, like, you know, what have I created and what have I done? And it's so beautiful now that um, you guys are playing music again and it's just positive and it's just like happy times now because it really would have been a shame to go like the rest of life without hearing anything from you guys again, you know, of just him carrying that like, oh, you know, not seeing the positive, you know, that really came out from it but only focusing on like, you know, the brawls and the, the, the fights and the, everything else that came out of the militant side of everything. Um, and so it, it thrilled me when I, when I heard that you guys were going on tour for that 25th anniversary thing and that he was out of the shadows and you guys were back together again, I looked directly at my son and I was like, 
I know the next concert that I'm taking you and you're going to remember this for the rest of your life, you know? And uh, he still talks about it with me still today, you know, 17 years old. And he remembers sitting at the sound man booth and uh, you know, watching the show. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I was really, I was especially happy for Mike, you know, cause he just disappeared. No one knew what the hell he was going on, you know, going on. Like no one knew what he, it was all these rumors. He was in a motorcycle gang, which was true. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, I kept on playing music, you know, I, you know, I did, you know, I was doing Gorilla Biscuits after Gorilla Biscuits, I joined Shelter. Shelter had this big long ride, you know, where, you know, that was, you know, we were selling hundreds of thousands of records, you know, touring with no doubt, you know, we had all this success and, you know, but Mike sort of just, you know, at the low point. You guys went on just, tour with no doubt. Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. We did, a, we did a whole U S tour. No doubt. It was oh, great. Holy shit. Okay. Wow. When no doubt was like the biggest band in the whole country. Right. You know, it was like when, when, it was like when don't speak was number one, we went on tour with them. Holy shit. Incredible. Okay. See, I didn't know that. I can't, it's so much of that time that I that like is a is a blur because I was traveling around the United States so much and and just had hundreds of different jobs and just trying to survive on my own, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I completely f yeah forgot all about that. Yeah, that's pretty cool, man. That's pretty cool. And yeah, and it was a good experience. Yeah, it was, it was great, it, you know, but, you know, the, the, the point of it was, you know, I never, I, I pretty much never stopped playing. Yeah. And, but, and Mike left at like a really low point where it was just like, you know, the fights and just like, you know, it just got to be just such a drag. And, he, you know, and, and then he dropped out of the scene, the hardcore, everything, didn't talk to anybody. So he, I, you know, <coughs> he never really, I, I don't think he never, he never really, understood the way that he had impacted countless of thousands of people you know and so when we finally you know like you said got him out of the shadows you know got him back in and we did that and we did that first um show at the, the black and blue bowl in new york and it sold out of, you know we headlined it it sold out immediately they had to add a second show that oh, well. sold out and that sold out immediately and like, he couldn't even believe it. Like, he was like, I can't even believe, you know, because, you know, back when we were playing, we played for 100, 200, 300 people. Right. And now we're selling out two shows in a row in New York City, 1,500 people each night. Right. And I think it, it, it finally kind of set into him like, wow, you know, this music that I made, like it had a, a huge impact on all these people. And I was super happy for him. Yeah, you guys could have done three or four or five shows, and I guarantee you they would have sold out every night. Those kids yeah, would have probably. come back. Those kids would have come back every single night, and they would have bought a ticket every single night. And it probably would have been hard for like other people to get tickets because like the real hardcore fans of they probably would have bought all five nights, like just been and been there every single night, uh, battered, bloodied, and bruised. You know, coming and back I tell each you, time. There was way more than 1,500 people in there. I mean, there was probably 2,500. Sure. Like, I remember I had went, I went out to eat and then I came back and it literally, it took me 45 minutes just to kind of work my way through the crowd to get back to the dressing room to get ready to play because there was so many people in there from front to back. It was like this. It was like, you know, shoulder to yeah, shoulder. Yeah, I'm not surprised like, at all. I'm not surprised at all. That was a huge thing, man. When I looked on the internet and it was like, I don't know what I was surfing around for or whatever, but it was like tickets for judge. And I was like, what? I mean, yeah. like, like <laughs> nobody my, saw that coming. It's yeah, like my jaw me. just like fucking <laughs> fell to the floor. And it was like, I called all my friends and I was just like, dude, we got, we're going, you know? And uh, we were in a pack, you know, and it was great. It was just fucking amazing. It was, uh, yeah. I, I, I stood there basically. I wanted, I was with my kid and so I couldn't go pit like the whole time. And uh, so I had to pretty much take care of him. And, uh, but man, I just was standing there like a fucking kid in a candy store. I, I couldn't have been more thrilled. Couldn't have been more yeah, me, thrilled. Me too. Me too. To play all those songs again. It was, it was great. Yeah. It was absolutely fucking amazing. Um, so when you, when you were, uh, did you ever think about like sticking with Gorilla Biscuits or, was uh 
you know, was that ever something that you had thought about or was it something that you were just like, okay, well, I'm going to jam and I'm going to do some shows and, you know. No, we were full on, like we were working on a new record. The songs were great. We were like in it to win it. We thought, okay. you know, uh, Gorilla Biscuits had actually gotten signed to, uh, uh, oh God, what's that record label? You know, that big record label. that was like a big, uh, big metal label and like Sick of It All were on it. Oh, geez, um, I don't know. Was it uh, In Effect or? Yeah, In Effect, In Effect. So we had gotten signed to In Effect. We were working on a new record. And Walter basically was just like, dudes, I'm sorry. I just got to pull the plug on this. Like things are really happening with Quicksand. Um, and we were all like a little heartbroken because, you know, the songs were really shaping up good. And Walter's a great songwriter. And, uh, you know, it was, it was just one of those things. It just, you know, just didn't happen. What about Bold? Um, you know, that they, uh, obviously they were, you know, part of like, in my opinion, kind of like the hardcore big four in the, you know, for straight edge and whatnot. And um, how, how did you guys, did you ever like, because obviously you're going band to band and you're bumping around and playing for people. Uh, what were the plans with Bold? Was that something that you looked forward to, like maybe create new records with them as well or? Uh, you know, Bold was a little different because I was never really in Bold. Mm. They were all friends of mine. They all went to my high school. Like when I was in high school, those dudes were in junior high school. Mm. And so they were just kids that I grew up with and were like, and, and were really good friends with. And so, you know, whenever they were going on tour and they needed a guitar player, they'd call me up and, you know, I would just jump at the chance to hang out with those guys because I was such good friends with them. Okay, so it was more stand-in type thing, you know? Yeah, it was It was more like, you know, come on tour with us. And I'd be like, okay, I'm a pirate. I like traveling around. <laughs> Let's do it. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that's another, uh, you know, nailed to the X. Uh, that's just, uh, that's another one of my youth anth anthems. It's just, um, you know, I could, I could go through, like, the whole list and the whole shebang of all those songs that, you know, meant so much and just, you know, were anthems in my mind and every once in a while i still catch myself you know washing the dishes nail to the axe you know and music's not even on you know and i'll just like yell it in the kitchen for some reason you know and um so it's in your bones <laughs> it is it really is man because it's like i listen to those you know those burned cassettes you know uh so many times that it was like you know i i I knew the riffs and I knew the songs and I knew the lyrics and I just, I knew everything. So just like, like the, my own hand, you know, and it just, uh, I honestly can't imagine like what my late teen years and my early twenties, uh, you know, I can't imagine like what I would have, I, I probably would have been listening to like, you know, Ozzy and Black Sabbath and all that stuff, you know, back like I was, or when I was a young teen, you know, but uh, I'm thankful for it. You know, I'm thankful for it that it came into my life. Um, yeah, it, it's pretty amazing because, you know, hardcore is so fast. You know, it's like all kinds of music got big. Like, you know, when I was a kid, at least in New York City, you know, the big underground music was, was hardcore, um, rap and death metal. And the scenes kind of spilled over onto each other. Like, you know, the Anthrax guys would come to CBGBs, you know, to all the shows. And, you know, KRS-One, you know, was friends with a bunch of hardcore kids. Like, you know, we were all just kind of misfits in these little tiny underground scenes. And so we could kind of relate to each other. And it seemed like all of that underground music got massive. Like punk got massive, alternative music got massive, rap got massive. You know, metal got massive, but hardcore didn't get massive. <laughs> hardcore still is like tiny scene. So I think a lot of people don't either like don't know about it or maybe don't have so much respect for it because it's this fast, crazy music that people jump off the stage to. But, you know, that music, it really had incredible messages to it. Like if you were on the inside and you were and, and, and you know, you took it seriously, you know, some of the best lyrics in the world out of any kind of music came out of the hardcore scene, if you ask me. That's, well, that's what, that's what draw, drew me to it was, it wasn't because, I mean, I had been listening to heavy metal ever since I was like, you know, 10 years old. 
um, that you know the speed and that that stuff that it, it, the, what that really wasn't the thing. It was it, the riffs were were cool, but it was like you know Black Sabbath had riffs too, and so what uh, you know Metallica, Nuclear Assault, they were fast. You know Slayer, they were fast. Um, the lyrics, it was the message, it was the delivery, it was it was you know you just felt like that. It was like the big brother that you never had and he was screaming at you through the speakers and he was telling you that you're fucking up and it's time to get your shit together you know and it was like everything that i personally needed during that time you know and and it was exactly like you said it was the lyrics and it was the message I, I remember, uh, you know, I was, fr I also grew up with um, Gavin from Burn. Do you remember that band, Burn? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, they're fantastic. So Gavin went to the high school, you know, um, you know our, the rival high school to my high school. We were friends. He's actually and one of my favorite singers. He's, his, his tone is just fucking amazing. Well, he's a guitar player. Gavin plays guitar. Chaka's the singer. Chaka, the, the singer. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I was friends with Gavin, who was a guitar player. So I, when I, I, met, I, I just meant that I remember Burn and that the guy from, yeah. So anyway, uh -huh. <laughs> I'm trying uh -huh. to save my own mistake here. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, Gavin was, when I met him, he was a metalhead kid, but he was into, you know, underground metal. He wasn't into mainstream metal. And so he came from, another, hold on one second. But, okay so um you know he was a metalhead kid i was a punk rocker and you know so we were both kind of outcasts so we kind of met up and became friends and i remember he said to me he goes he goes i'm gonna play you some music that you're that's gonna i'm gonna play you some music that is gonna be like it's gonna shake you to the ground. It's gonna like open you up. You're gonna have this paradigm shift. You're not even gonna believe it. I said, okay, I'll bring over some records too. And so I brought, I, I think I brought him over. I brought him the Antidote seven inch because it was kind of like metallic and I thought he might like it. And I brought him Minor Threat. And I think I brought him Black Flag Damaged because I thought that had some riffs to it too that he might like. Pretty dope, yeah. And then, so the album that he sat me down that he thought was going to be this groundbreaking, life-changing record for me was the first Metallica record. And he put it on, and, like, I started listening to it. I was like, you know, the first song is Hit the Lights. I believe. Right. And, you know, the song starts, you know, I'm like, wow, this is fast. This is energetic. This is really good. And then I heard the first line of it. The first line is so stupid. The opening line of the whole record is something like, I got I to gotta look it up. Hold on, because I don't want to get this wrong. No, take your time. Take your time. I can't remember what it is. It's been so long since I've listened to that record. All Did right. You... Here's the opening to the here's the opening line to the Metallica record. No life to leather. We're gonna kick some ass tonight. We got the metal madness. When our fans start screaming, it's right. Well, all right, yeah. When we start to rock. Uh, we never want to stop again. Hit the lights. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I heard that and I'm just like, dude, I'm not into this. This is fucking <laughs> stupid. I was like, you want to hear something that's going to change your life? Listen to this minor threat record. Yeah, right. Yeah, there you go. You know what I mean? Yeah. And as much as I could appreciate the music, the message was just like, I can't. This is yeah. dumb. It's metalhead stuff, you know, and so, yeah, and so it has its place, you know, and it worked super well, and it had its place, but it definitely wasn't like message music, you know? It yeah, definitely... and, you know, as much, as much as people don't take hardcore seriously, like, those, the message, you know, the, the message and the lyrics of hardcore, they had some depth to them. Yeah. You know? You know, it wasn't like anybody's going to listen to Hit the Lights and, they're and you know, they're going to make these major sweeping changes in their life and, you know, they're going to go up to... No, no. Hit the Lights, the only, the, the, the purpose for Hit the Lights, the purpose for Metallica itself until 
I mean, they didn't really, I can't even really say that they did anything like kind of like message wise in their music till way, way late. But like the whole point of that stuff was moshing. That's it. Get in the pit and just, you know, mosh. Go as fast as possible well, and just beat well, each people other. Had, up, people, you know? people didn't mosh because I went to I went to see them on the Ride the Lightning tour. Uh -huh. It was pretty cool. I saw Metallica with Cliff Burton. Yeah, my first and, concert, I was 15 years old. I was on I saw uh, Metallica open up for Ozzy Osbourne on the uh, Master of Puppets tour. Yeah, with Cliff right was, before he died. Yeah. This was Metallica headlining at a small club and they played wow, with great. Wasp and Armored Saint. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's a lineup. So that so then I had to sit th I had to sit through Wasp and I was like this is entertaining but this is effing stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you No, know, those guys have actually turned into like heroes in like the metal scene. You would I, I was a show promoter for 5 years and wow. you would not believe how like iconic and how big of heroes that those guys are in the heavy metal scene they're like like literally heroes they've become so iconic really? it's crazy yeah it's really wow. it's really crazy and and it's like la glam and you know i mean i grew up listening to la glam and and they're you know and and i've always had a really big appreciation for all types of music and and whatnot and i've got a big la glam collection in my records um but um you know i could never understand how the hell like all these extreme metal guys like black metal and like the really extreme scene why they liked a glam rock band you know it was uh you know so yeah it's it is funny yeah so yeah, you survived you know, it, the show it, yeah well it was, it was so boring to me because it was just like i mean it was a small club and it was probably yeah. only like maybe 600 people and everybody was just doing this Headband. They were just banging their head the whole time. I was like, "Yeah, man, all I want to do is just like stage dive. You know, that was the beauty of hardcore too. You could get up on the stage, you could grab the mic, you could sing along with the singer. Right. You know, you were, you were moved by the message of the music so much that, you know, people would pile on the stage and sing along with the chorus. People don't know, but hardcore is the best music. <laughs> my, my, one of the greatest experiences of my life um was getting on stage and singing at uh, uh it was in berkeley at gilman street yeah great club we just and, we played there right before the pandemic and um it was gorilla biscuits um american standard and uh oh god i can't remember um wow this is this sucks that i can't remember the name of the band um they were one of the first openly gay hardcore bands um oh, and i can't remember uh what the name of the band was but they were huge and they're huge today that sucks that i can't remember who the name is um that was one of the greatest experiences of my life you know was that i could get on stage and I could grab the mic with the singer, you know, I could like put my arm around him and be like, fuck yeah, this is amazing. And uh, yeah, it was one of the greatest experiences. Of it. it just like, yeah, changed my life, changed my life. Where, where else can you do that? Where yeah, you, you know, and I'm still, I'm 50 years old and I'm still jumping on stage. I'm still doing backflips. I'm still killing myself at shows, you know, and I can't walk for weeks, you know, my back, I'm, you know, chugging down ibuprofens, you know, painkillers, just walking around the house, you know, still doing it. I mean, the last time I saw Suicidal Tendency is I staged that 37 times, you know? Yeah, I, I remember those days. <laughs> you know, do you still, do you still uh, stage dive when you go see shows? Do you get the um, urge? I don't really, you know, I don't really go to shows unless I'm playing them. Really? Yeah, not really. I mean, I live in upstate New York now and, you know, mild-mannered yoga teacher. <laughs> so uh, I, don't really, I don't really get out that much. Uh, it's too bad because I couldn't, I couldn't live without it. You know, I'm waiting for the, uh, I'm waiting for everything to lift up here in Germany and I can't wait to get back on stage again and fly through the air and backflip. Uh, 
a shelter may, might play in Germany in December. Really? Yeah, hopefully. Wow. Well, that would be really super cool, man. That would be super cool. If you guys come through here, I'll try to uh, try to bribe my way through the security and say hello somehow. Uh -huh. You know, as, as, as long as they don't force me to get vaccinated, <laughs> we'll play. No, there's no there's no law yet. And the um, I think the only thing is that they've requiring this like green travel card that starts on July 1st and it's going to go for a year. And but there's there's three ways that you can use it is that if you've recovered, if you've got a 20 a within a 24 hour test, which is negative, or if you've done uh, two vaccinations two vaccination shots and you so there's the three ways so it's not law that you have to get vaccinated it's just uh that you have to be one of the three so um uh that you've been through it you've got a test that's negative or the vaccination so i'm pretty guaranteed you guys will have no problem all right great yeah, looking, but um, looking forward to it. But it's pretty slow, though. You know, um, uh, my friend Andy Brings from uh, Zodom, he's uh, playing with his new pop punk band and um, on Saturday. And we've got to wear a mask. Our seats are two meters apart. And we have to get a test 24 hours before the show. Well, that's weird. It's not like that in America. In America, people are stage diving and. Wow. Jeez, They've already be, had a bunch of shows. Wow, that would be amazing, man. I just, uh, it's, it's, uh, everybody is so stressed out about it and everybody's just so over it. And um, we're just tired of it, you know, absolutely tired of it. You can see it in people's faces when you're on the street. Um, even like they've lifted up the group rules and now you can meet in groups in the parks and they're not really too strenuous on it, you know, they're not really too strict. Um, but you still, you can see it on people's faces. Everybody's kind of looking around. And when you walk on the street, people like move, if you're not wearing a mask and people that I know were like, listen, if I'm not sick now, I'm not getting sick. You know, I've, I've, it's been a year and a half now. I'm, I'm healthy. You know, my immune system's strong, you know, and so I don't have anything to worry about. Yeah. That's my thing. My thing health is Health doesn't come from a shot. Health comes from your lifestyle. But it, and my belief is that it comes from your mental thinking. Sure, um, and it I, plays a I, huge part of it. You know, I'm a really, really, really big supporter of that. Your current state of health has a direct connection with your current mental stability and what you're putting into your mind. Um. Exactly. You know, people don't realize that. People think that health is what you eat, but health is what you consume through all of your senses, through Absolutely. your mind, through your thoughts, through what you see, the different music that you listen to. That's all going to affect your health. If you're listening to like negative music, like, you know, death metal about serial killers and things like that, you know, that's going to put your mind, you know, in a certain place, a certain unhealthy place. Absolutely. You know, it's, 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 it's everything that you consume. It's not just your food. You know, you can eat the healthiest food in the world, but if you're still consuming junk sounds or, you know, junk sights, um, you know, and you have junky thoughts because of it, you're never really going to be truly healthy. And it is true. You know, it's, it actually starts in your mind and it manifests in your body. Like you can, you can stress yourself sick. You can be under so much stress that it'll end up, you know, making your, you know, making your body sick. Oh, absolutely. And I firmly so, believe it, you know, and I talk to so many people about it and I try to tell these people, it's like, you know, don't, don't concern yourself with, you know, making doctor's appointments unless you're like deathly ill, you know, think positive, eat positive, you know, uh, do positive things in your life, hang around with positive people. Um, one of the reasons I got out of show promotions was because I was, uh, I was, uh, doing, um, uh, extreme metal, you know, for quite a long time and not just hardcore not just punk and, and, but, uh, the other 50% of it was, uh, the extreme metal scene. And it was just having a really super negative effect on me. It's like all these 
just really dark people. And it just, uh, it just wasn't really in tune with my spirituality, you know? And um, I had, you know, I've always had a really big connection with spirituality pretty much my whole life. And the way that these guys were looking at spirituality, it was just the dark. It was just the, you know, and it, it just didn't resonate, you know? And um, after a while, I just got out. I just, it just wasn't my thing. And, um, you know, the last time I was in a hospital, I was eight years old. And I've got a hernia that I've got to go and get an operation for. And I actually talked to my friend and I was like, God, you know, I'm really kind of worried about going to the hospital because I've never thought about it for so long. And I'm worried that it's going to fuck my way of thinking up that it's going to kind of br- like, like a, a break in my dominoes, you know, it's like it, everything's been going so great. My body's been healthy and everything's going good. And then I got this hernia from carrying all my records DJing and uh, I'm like, fuck man, I don't know if I really want to go, but I have to, I got no way out of it. You know, mm-hmm. it's this, uh, but this, this, the power of positive thinking and the power of positive living and all that stuff. It's like really kept me healthy. You know, I believe it. So, so true. Yeah. I tr- Un- undoubted, undoubtedly true. So, so that brings me kind of like, um, there was a whole bunch of things I wanted to talk to you about, but there's like, you know, so many podcasts that have already covered like all the fanzine stuff and, um, you know, all that. Um, cause it's, you know, your life right now, from what I see is like your yoga, you're doing the yoga class and tell me a little bit about that. And, uh, what's current life like for you now? Well, you know, it was weird for me in the pandemic because I was more of like a, a traveling yoga teacher. Okay. And so I would, I would go around, I would do retreats, I would do workshops and, uh, you know, and then the lockdown hit and it was, it was like everything got canceled. Even all my touring got canceled. I was like, oh my God, how am I going to make money? <laughs> do, you, do you still have the restaurant or? Um, I never had a restaurant. I thought you had a restaurant. For some reason, I had read on the internet that you ran a vegan restaurant. Uh, Is that bullshit? I've, e- I, I've eaten at vegan restaurants. I've never ran a vegan restaurant. Crazy. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm, I'm almost positive that uh, I had read along the line somewhere that you had your own vegan restaurant in New York or something like that. Totally. I had, my own, I had my own yoga studio in upstate New York, but okay. I never ran a vegan restaurant. See, the internet lies. See, people yeah. do not believe what the internet tells you. You know, go straight to the source. You know, crazy. I don't know where, I don't know how I got that in my head then. Because I, I know definitely, maybe it's the Mandela effect. You know, you think you read something and you don't, you know, it's like how people say there's two versions of movies and things like that, you know. Uh-huh. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard that theory about the mandala theory? <laughs> I've never, I've never heard that. I know, I'm, I know what a mandala is. Yeah, there's a mandala theory, and what it means is that we remember things that weren't real, and we will swear that uh, we remember that things actually happened. And uh, one of the most famous ones is the, um, I forget what it is, which um, I think it's Disney. And in the beginning of the Disney movies, you have, it says Disney. And then um, even me, I swear that this was actually the reality is that Tinkerbell flies out with a wand. But when you look at it, there's no Tinkerbell and there's no wand. That's the Mandela effect. And people swear by it. And they're like, yeah, there really was. There was Tinkerbell, you know, with the, you know, that's the, so maybe that was the thing with the restaurant. I don't know. Maybe I just, yeah, maybe. Imagined. Yeah. So no restaurant. No restaurant. Okay. That's crazy. I don't know. Um, do you uh, have an official school? But you have an official school. Um, I had, I had my own yoga studio, but um, I moved to California for a few years. And so I, I actually sold it to Ray Capo, who was also a yoga teacher. Yeah. Like yeah, a big, yeah, time, yeah. big time yoga teachers. Uh, Christian's name's Raghunath. He goes by. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so he, so he took it over. It actually closed during the pandemic, which is kind of sad, but, um, yeah, I was kind of left like, what am I going to do? And so I started doing yoga classes online and it's been a big success. 
And so I do them every day. I was doing, um, I was doing seven o'clock classes also seven o'clock and 10. Okay. But for now I'm only doing the, the 10 o'clock class. Although I'm thinking about, I'm going to sort of retool the whole thing. And I'm going to have a website where people can just, you know, pay directly however they want to pay, you know, with like credit card and stuff and make it a little bit more professional. Yeah, cool. And when, when I do that, I'll probably have, uh, I'll probably do two classes, like a morning class and a, and a 10 a.m. class. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've also been recording all the classes too. So I'm going to do something with all the recordings for, for you know, if it doesn't fit in, in people's time slots, they can do the pre-recorded classes. Okay. So I'm going to meet with some people and some. So will this be something like on Spotify where you can like, you know, like how Joe Rogan's got his podcast and like everybody, you know, are you going to do it something like that? Or is it going to be it, it, it's like, going to be like something YouTube it format? Will, it will be something like that. I'm not sure what format it's going to be, whether it's Patreon or YouTube or maybe um, I'll have it on my own website. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm going to be meeting with some people that are going to help me out and help me to make it a little bit more professional. Okay. But for now, if anybody wants to um, do yoga, I do my class every day at 10 a.m. It's great. It's, hard, it's called the Hardcore Yoga. It's a very challenging class. Um, you know, it's very physical. You'll get in great shape if you do it. It's suitable for beginners. Like I've had, I've had beginners. Okay. I have everybody from beginners to, you know, people that are like yoga teachers that are like incredible at yoga that take the class. Okay. Um, I'll always get, you know, for beginners, I'll always give like easier ways to do, you know, to do the stuff. But it's a pretty hard class. Like, come and, you know, be prepared for a freaking workout, and you'll definitely be sweating. Yeah, because I see Ray doing, like, handstands and all this crazy shit, and I'm just like, fuck, man. I was like – because I had considered, you know, jumping in on some of his courses on online. And um, and then I see – then I click on and I'm like, okay, well, what's, what's he doing? You know? And then he's like, you know, balancing on his knees and he's doing handstands and everything. And I'm like, man, I can't fucking do that. You know? Well, you know, you'd be surprised. You would be really surprised. I've had people in my class. One guy took my class. He had never taken a yoga class um, before. He started taking my class online within like six months. He was doing handstands, crazy arm balances, you know, he would just come every day and he just got better and better and better and in better shape and in better shape and in better shape. So it's sort of like, it, it, it's more of a, you know, it, it definitely has a spiritual bent to it too. Like I always start the class with some kind of stories or some kind of like wisdom talk. And we also do chanting. We'll sit down, we'll do some mantra meditation. Um, so it's a, it's a really kind of cool mix of almost like power yoga and you know blended with spirituality and people seem to really be digging it so um if you want to learn about it go to my instagram the instagram is the hardcore yogi all one word yep and if you if you go back on a few of the posts it'll tell you how to sign up and stuff like that and uh it should be retooled you know very soon at least by like the end of the summer where it'll be more streamlined and most of the stuff will be online through a website and you can pay with credit cards and stuff like that. Um, when did you decide that you wanted to do this? You know, it's like, you know, you back in the his, going back in history and whatnot, you, uh, you know, you said that there was a point in life where you started to become spiritual and you, uh, you know, did you become spiritual? And then you and Ray were like, let's do shelter. Or did you guys, get spiritual and was it was just like a way of life how did the whole story fold out like from then up until now like in your spirituality well ray got into it first when ray quit youth today he disappeared he was he almost like pulled the mic judge he went to india he moved into ashrams you know he lived in temples he became like a, a brahmachari monk himself yeah 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 and you know it's not like you know it and that was really early on. I mean, that was in the eighties. Okay. You think about it. Okay. And you know, so things aren't like they are now with like cell phones and the internet and email and stuff like that. Like you couldn't get a hold of him. You had no clue what he was doing or where he was or, you know, so I just kind of like lost touch with him for a number of years. I, I heard that he was doing shelter and I actually played on before I joined the band and before I was, um, got into the whole Krishna thing, I played on the No Compromise record. He had put out a, an EP, it was called No Compromise, and me and Sammy from Youth Today played on it, just because he asked us to do him a favor. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, 
after it, it was it was mostly after all the band you know after gorilla biscuits broke up and judge broke up and i was kind of deciding what my next step in life was going to be and like i said you know, you know like we were talking about earlier you know i really wanted to just climb down that ladder and kind of take a break and realize and you know figure out what the right wall is to put the ladder against before I started climbing the ladder again. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to get into, you know, just kind of like, and it wasn't even like I wanted to get religious or something like that. It was more of like, I just kind of wanted to find myself and find my place in the world. And, you know, uh, and I, and I, I don't know where it came from, but, you know, from the time I was like a little kid, I always had this thing where I, you know, I was into like self-improvement. Like I wanted to get better. I wanted to get better physically. I was like that, you know, 15 year old kid doing push-ups and sit-ups, you know, in, in his room. Like I just had this idea that I wanted to make myself better always. And so, you know, when I sat down and I was thinking about like, how can I make myself better, more compassionate, more kind, you know, that's a, that's a spiritual path. And that's, pretty much what led me to Krishna consciousness. You know, it, it was his calling in me to get better. Mm -hmm. and, what was it, what was it specifically though, that like turned you on about Krishna's consciousness? I mean, cause you could have chosen, you could have chosen like, you know, any numerous paths of spirituality, you know, I mean, there's left hand, right hand occultism. There's like all kinds of like really super positive spiritual paths. You know, what was it specifically about Krishna consciousness that, you know, turned you on? Was it just the respect that you had for your buddy Ray and like he's kind of turning you on and what, what was it you specifically? Know, you know, I don't I can't I can't quite put my finger on it, but I think it must have had something to do with some kind of past life experiences. OK, because from the second that I went to a Krishna temple. I loved it. Yeah, like see the, the chanting, was, the chanting, the mantras, the altar, the incense, the food, yeah. the the monks, like everything just immediately resonated with me and it, it resonated with me. And it was so weird because the first time that I went to India and I was going to all these like ancient temples and really diving into, you know, bhakti. It was like, when I went to India, I was like, I'm home. Like, I love this. Like, I feel more at home in India than I, than I do in America. So I don't know what it was. It might have been a past life thing. Maybe I was some kind of monk in a past life or whatever. But from the second that I got into it, I just, there was something about it just that just grabbed me and, and resonated with me. And, I, and I, I couldn't answer that question. It was just something mysterious. Yeah, it's... Um... It, it's it's one of the points in my life that I had that I look back and I regret because I really believe that if I had made the choice when I was standing there at the ashram and um, the, the, actually it was it was actually it was actually a full on temple uh, in Detroit I can't remember the name it was so many years ago the Fisher but, Manor but uh, the, I'm the, sorry the, the the Fisher Mansion that yes one? yes yeah that's it. That's it. Holy shit, man. Yeah. That's a, that's a cool, that's a cool place. That's it. Yep. That was it. Yeah. I re and, and it was, it was kind of the same feeling. It was, um, it was just something that drew me and something that I've never let go in my life. And, um, I've always, you know, in times of, uh, you know, confusion and whatnot, I always look to the holy books that I have here in my house. And uh, it's always helped me a lot along the way. And um, so did you yourself just all of a sudden say, okay, I'm going to now also be a monk? Or did you just kind of study? Did you just immerse full on? You know, they don't call it hardcore for nothing. Usually the people that get into hardcore yeah. are, are a little bit. Gra gravitate towards extremes you know yeah. what i mean it's yeah. like such an extreme music extreme lifestyle and especially for me yeah. i was almost like a professional hardcore musician like you know i graduated college and that that was it i just dedicated myself to punk well, i got in a, i got in a van i would just drive till the wheels fell off you know i was always that type of guy that like 
I wasn't going to dabble. You know what I mean? Like, well, the name I was going to jump into it. The name Poor Cell is synonymous with hardcore. So, I mean, you, there's no getting out of that one. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, if I was going to, if I'm going to get into this, I'm going to get into this. And I moved into a temple. I shaved my head, became a brahmachari, became a monk, traveled all over, went to India, studied with monks. It was really cool. It was a really cool time in my life just to kind of like unplug from the material world and plug right into spirituality in like a really, you know, in-depth way. It was, it was, it was absolutely amazing. How long did you stay uh, studying? I lived in temples for about five or six years. Okay. Wow. Okay. Okay. And, a, and, and a lot of those years I lived as like a real hardcore monk. Like, you know, I would wake up at three 30 in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, go through a whole morning program of, you know, chanting and meditation and, you know, singing and, um, you know, learning cooking and, uh, you know, uh, how to make everything that you do, you know, even something like as, seemingly mundane is cooking into a meditation yeah you know absolutely. cooking as an cooking as an offering and it was just it was an incredible time i learned so much like i didn't go to college but i got like a you know phd in in krishna bhakti and i wouldn't trade that for for the anything in the world yeah i always tell people you know that um once you open your heart and you open your mind to spirituality that, um, you know, those material universities, you know, become kind of meaningless and you get, at least in my experience, um, I got more out of uh, studying spirituality than I ever did in any of those semesters that I studied in university. You know, and I ended up actually being a lecturer as an English teacher here in Germany. And um, it was always funny looking at my students, like, you know, because I always wanted to tell people, but you can't mix that kind of stuff when you're in school. You can't tell your students, you know, your own spiritual beliefs, you know. So there's always that kind of red line that you can never cross over. And mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I always saw myself as being the, the uh, university teacher that was going to lead all the students off the canvas and campus and just be like, you know, fuck this place. We're out of here, you know, and we're going to, you know, go follow our, our, our souls and our beliefs. Um, how often do you go back and forth now uh, to India and do you teach in India? Do you, um, what's, what's life like for that? Well, I was going to India about once a year, every year, just to kind of recharge my spiritual batteries mm -hmm. and just, you know, get in there, you know, do a lot of studying, do a lot of meditation and just, you know, being in these, you know, uh, in these doms, these like, you know, spiritual mm -hmm. ep epicenters, you know, in, in India where like, you know, the, the company that you keep affects you. So when you go to these, you know, holy cities in India, you know, the people are, it's a holy city for a reason because the people that are there are, you know, into spirituality. And so you get immersed into like this whole culture of spirituality where everything revolves around, you know, developing your, your higher nature, everything that you do, your whole entire lifestyle, you know, it's, it's, it's the exact opposite of America, where the entire focus of America is economic development. And as a matter of fact, we'll even, you know, we even will elect the leader of our country just on the basis of who's going to make us more money. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's why Trump got elected. You know, right. people thought he's going to he's going to make us money. He's a good businessman. Right. You know, but when you go to these places in India instead of the focus being on that the whole entire focus is your spiritual development it's your spiritual connection with your with your higher power or with krishna with with god and there's something so powerful about that to immerse yourself in that kind of in, in that kind of culture and you know there's something you know and especially like you know even just being an american you know where the whole culture is just is just 
churning towards materialism. And when you're just part of that, you can just get so easily caught up with caught up in that. So well, I consider going to India almost like just recharging my battery so I can spend another year in America and not and not and not get overwhelmed with the you know materialistic flow of our society. So I used to go I, I used to try to go at least once a year. Um, but with the lockdown, it's been hard. You know, I haven't been to India in two years, which is um, a really big bummer for me. But I think I'm going to go in January. Cool. I um, I was in Africa just before the pandemic hit, and I was in Morocco. And Morocco for me was a absolute life changing experience. It was um, it was the the first time. It was well. Let me go back. It was the first time that I'd been to Africa, first time that I'd been out of Europe since I moved over here to Germany in 2004, because I used to live in in Oregon and then California before that, Detroit and all over the United States. And I grew up in the ghetto my whole life. My mom was a biker chick. Um, you know, she hung out with the dirty dozen and she drank at the same bar as Sonny Barger. I had bikers living in the garage. My mom wow. drove, you know, my, uh, my mom, she drove a chopper through a 7-Eleven window. You know, I mean, I. I you, you, and Mike, you, you and Mike Judge could have some interesting conversations. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, hint, hint, you know, I'm looking for guests, you know. Um, uh so I grew up, you know, and I thought in my life that I had seen ghettos, you know, I, you know, used to sit in the backyard and slingshot and shooting baby uh, BBs at rats and, you know, shit like that, you know, and had rats crawling through our walls in the house. We had scorpions in Arizona and rattlesnakes in the bathtub. And I mean, just, you know, crazy shit, you know, growing up. And when I went to Africa, um, it completely changed my perspective on every aspect of my entire life. And I made the decision that when I came back from Africa, that I was going to completely change the way that I ate, the way that I shopped, the way that I interacted in society with people, um, the way that I ordered food in restaurants. Um, we we got to uh, Morocco and we went to um, Tangier. It was the first city we went to. And we were just like typical Europeans. We sat down and we ordered just a shitload of food, you know, because we had pockets full of euros and we we're hungry. And so we order a table full of food. And then kids started coming over to the table begging and then the restaurant owners were like beating the kids, you know, get the fuck out of here, kicking them and stuff. Old ladies would come up and the restaurant owners were kicking the ladies and get out of here and all that. And I, I looked at my table and I looked at the, the horror that was like sitting in front of me, this massive amount of food that I just didn't need. I was, I felt like, I felt so embarrassed at that moment that I just was like, I'm never ever going to fucking do this again in my life, you know? And when I came back, I didn't go shopping for like two weeks because I said, I'm going to eat every single thing that is in my house and I'm not going to throw anything away, you know, unless it's absolutely rotten. You know, when I go shopping now, it's like, I, um, I focus on what I buy. And when I go into a restaurant, I don't order huge, massive plates of shit, you know, and so that, you know, that I can't eat. Um, when you went to India, you know, did it affect you the same way the first time? Like, did you say to yourself, Jesus Christ, what a, what a horrible capitalist American I've been my whole life, you know? Well, it, it affected me, you know, later on, later on, on later trips to India, like I'd gone to Calcutta and ski like the slums in Calcutta, which is yeah. so eye opening. Yeah. It's, it, and it's like you said, you think, you know, being poor in America is one thing until you see the slums of Calcutta and you're just like, oh, my God. Right. Um, I saw things in, in Morocco that I never I, like, I just couldn't imagine. And people were like, oh, that's nothing. 
And I was yeah. like, fuck, man. I was like, I don't even know if I want to travel now. You know, it's like, fuck, you know. You know, the, the biggest eye-opening cultural thing that hit me in India was, you know, I was studying at all these ashrams that are way out in villages. And so, you know, you have these villagers that are super poor. They don't have a dime to their name. You know, they don't create money. They're poverty stricken. Um, but when you have like a deep spiritual life and when you're in deep spiritual communities, you don't need much to be happy. And I can see these people that live in mud huts. Um, you know, they, they barely have the clothes on their back, but because they have Krishna, because they have like, um, you know, a connection with God and, and, you know, they feel that love of God in their heart and they let that radiate out to all, you know, everybody that they meet, even Americans that, you know, you know, that come, I was so inspired by that. Here's mm -hmm. people, they have nothing yeah. yet. They have everything and they're happy. You can see it on, you, you can just see it in their face. They're happy. They don't need iPhones and all these unnecessary necessities that, that we have, they have food, they have clothes, they make it themselves. They grow it themselves. They're happy. They have community. They have families. They live in villages. They know all their neighbors. Um, they all care about each other. They take care of each other. They're, you know, they're, they're friends. They're connected. They have deep personal connections that we don't have in America. And it was a real big eye opener for me. Yeah. It, it was. It was like you know, here we are in America. We have everything, but you know what else we have? Anxiety, depression, isolation, loneliness. You know, people yeah. have taken, you know, every pharmaceutical illegal and legal under the, you know, under the sun to try to, you know, medicate their pain away. And here's these people that have nothing and they have everything. Um, and, and it was it was an eye opener to me to move more into that, you know, move more into, you know, my spiritual focus and, mm -hmm. and move more into a, a place of trying to like give instead of take because that's what really makes you happy mm. as opposed to in america with this rat race where we're trying to get 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 and we're and we're miserable you know there's yeah. a real lesson there's a real lesson in, in in that yeah and that was my big takeaway from morocco too was that like um everybody was just so happy and friendly and just so nice to me and there was just uh all this like preconceptions of like traveling in Africa just quickly left me. But the thing that really affected me the most was when we visited the ghettos, you know, and we visited some students there and it just, it never left me, you know, and still, still sits with me today, you know, and I look at, I, I just look around at this time that we've been in the pandemic and all that. And uh, it's really changed my whole perspective of like, what do I need in life? Um, exactly. Yeah. I had that um, same experience. You know, speaking about um, spirituality and speaking about um, uh, being in India and being the fact that, you know, you're a yoga teacher and you've embraced Krishna consciousness and you are uh, straight edge and you are a, you know, you basically, you and Mike basically kind of created the militant uh view on straight edge and which is kind of which is it's caught it's calmed down after o over the years and whatnot i, I was going to say yeah unfortunately <laughs> and um and so what is your view in spirituality and in india about the yogis uh smoking marijuana and utilizing this in their opinion as a way of getting in touch with Krishna consciousness. Well, I'll how do you, how do you feel, how do you feel about it? You know, I'll, I'll tell you a story about my guru's guru. My yeah. guru, my, my guru's spiritual teacher was AC Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Yeah. who you know, oh. he's, he's known as like the leader of the, of the Krishna movement. Really what he did was, you know, he was a, he was a guru in India that was ordered by his own guru to spread all these principles to the West. So he came to New York penniless just with his order of this, you know, and he was old, he was 70 years old, but he had this order of his guru hanging over his head that, you know, go out and try to spread these spiritual principles to a spiritually bankrupt culture in the West. 
So he came to America, he sacrificed everything, lived like a pauper for, you know, a while before things started to, you know, take off. And so, you know, this was in the 60s. So in the 60s, people thought, you know, mind expansion comes from smoking pot, you know, mind expansion comes from taking mushrooms, you know, spiritual connection comes from taking mushrooms. LSD was really big. Right. And LSD was touted as the next thing that was going to like save the world and everybody was going to take LSD and become so spiritually um, connected that there wasn't going to be any war anymore. And so Timothy Leary, who, you know, invented, literally invented LSD and was like the LSD guru, he had an ashram in upstate New York. Yeah. And it it was sort of like a their idea was they were going to become spiritual by taking a bunch of LSD, which they did. And so one time he brought, and so Prabhupada had an ashram in the Lower East Side on 2nd Avenue, 26 2nd Avenue. And so he brought his whole entire ashram to Prabhupada's ashram. And they sat down in front of Prabhupada and they said, they told them all about LSD and, and, you know, all about how they had developed in a lab and DMT and how it opens your mind and does all these things in your brain. And they said, you know, Prabhupada, what do you think of this? And he said, do you think that Krishna is so cheap that you can just take a pill and become connected with Krishna? Mm. He said, that's not, that's not the way it works. Krishna is not that cheap. Mm. You, can't just, you can't just change your heart and go from being controlled by your senses and your lower nature automatically by you know, taking, some, taking some pill. It's a, it's a lot of internal work that you have to go through. It's a lifetime of internal work of, you know, following certain principles, you know, regulative principles that are, that, that are going to, you know, escape you from that control of your lower nature and kind of make your mind peaceful so you can sort of live according to your higher principles. You know, you, you know, these regular principles that teach you, you know, you, usually when you, you know, move into a yoga ashram in India or anywhere, the first thing that they do is they ask you to control your senses. Mm-hmm. You don't take drugs. You don't eat meat. You, le- you live a regulated life. You wake up early. You take cold showers. These are all things that are going to actually help expand your mind and help you to be able to control your senses. If you can't control your senses, you're always going to be pulled to, you know, you know, by your senses to a lower place. You're going to, you're going to see, you're going to see food. I want to eat that. You're going to, you know, you're going to see, you know, you live like an animal unless you are, unless you can start, you know, control your senses and, you know, be able to reel your senses into, to be able to even be in that place where is this going to help me spiritually or is this going to harm me? Oh, this is going to harm me spiritually. I'm not going to do it. You know, most people are just like, I just want to kind of party and have fun in life. And like that case of beer is going to help me do that. You know, but a yogi is a little bit more, thoughtful and Mm -hmm. think okay is drinking this case of beer is this going to help me evolve spiritually the answer is no i'm not going to do it (laughs) you know what i mean and it's 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 hard work like that you have to kind of like unlearn all the things that you learn from materialistic culture and you have to you know start living according to higher principles so you know it's to me it's that whole kind of like american culture thing where i want to microwave my food you know, I don't want to. I don't want to spend the time to cook an actual healthy meal from scratch. You know, I want to just microwave a meal and have it in three seconds and be healthy. It's not going to happen. Microwave food is terrible for you. So people want just like they want fast food. They want fast enlightenment, and they think I'm going to bypass. You know, thousands of years of you know what sages and gurus have told me and i'm just going to bypass and i'm just going to pop a tab of acid on my tongue and i'm going to become enlightened it's it's so cheap what you is know, that you know, here's another story about him there was another guru named neem karoli baba yeah in please india and he had you know a lot of hippies kind of gravitated towards towards him and one time they told him about lsd and and how the and how you could have deep spiritual experiences on it and so he said okay give me some lsd and so they gave him a huge dose of lsd and they thought he was going to be like tripping super hard but he went around his day like he was completely unaffected by the lsd and at the end of the day they said they said guru dave what did you think of this lsd and he said 
He said, this is nothing new. For mm. thousands of thousands and thousands of years, people have been trying to find enlightenment through mushrooms and magic mushrooms and this and that and this kind of drug and smoking ganja. And he said, he said, these things can kind of let you know that there's more to life out there than just hardcore materialism. I think the way that he put it was, you know, these things may be able to like, you can barely crack open the door of spirituality and peer inside and see that there's more of life just than the, just the materialistic life that, that you've led your whole life. So you can open the door and you can peer in, but these things will never allow you to open the door and walk through and walk into spiritual life. They may give you little glimpses. Um, and a lot of times you can't even trust that because they may give you something that's just totally fabricated in your mind also. You know, it's, into it's intoxication. It's not something that you, that's like, that's going to give you like stable spiritual realizations. Um, so usually in any kind of, you know, serious yoga culture, those things are sort of downplayed. Okay. So what's your take on the whole um, Agora yogis uh, who consume everything as a gift from god and they say that you know their whole concept is that everything that is uh everything that is in life is a gift from god and that their whole concept is to ingest and experience every aspect left and right uh path uh what's your whole take on that you know when you guys go out there is it something that you guys avoid completely and just are like Hey, you know, that's cool. It's your thing. And it's your take on, uh, Krishna consciousness. Uh, how do you, how do you, uh, approach it and how do you deal with it? You know, especially because in the straight edge community, you know, you know I can, I, I can only speak for, you know, the bhakti yoga tradition that, you know, I've been part of, but you know, a lot of the, you know, you'll see a lot of, you know, you'll see a lot of like, you know, spiritual traditions in India where they'll, um, you know, smoke pot. And, uh, you know, you see a lot of people that worship Lord Shiva, mm -hmm. you know, since, since they think, okay, well, Shiva smoked pot. Now I guess it's okay for me to smoke pot, but you know, my gurus and Prabhupada and my lineage that I was from, they said, and I even think there's, you know, there's stuff written in like the Upanishads that says, it's like, if you want to smoke pot, like Lord Shiva, you, you'd better be able to drink an ocean of poison like Lord Shiva did. You know, there's one pastime of Lord Shiva where you know, the demigods and the demons, they churned this ocean of milk and this massive amount of poison came out of it. And to save, to save humanity, Shiva took all this poison. He drank it himself to, you know, to save the people of the earth. And so obviously Lord Shiva is not, a, not, he's a special, he's a special soul. <laughs> you know, right, I mean, right, he, right. he can drink an ocean of poison, you know, so. It's not that you're supposed to, you know, do everything that these, you know, that these demigods do, you know, mm -hmm. what you're, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to follow in their footsteps and follow their instructions. Um, and so, you know, all the instructions that I've gotten, you know, from my, you know, from my path is that intoxication will always lead you to a dark place. So, so don't indulge in, in it, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, even, 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 even spirituality, you know, e even intoxication, even for like, you know, so-called spiritual per spiritual uh, purposes, it's just the nature of intoxication. The nature of intoxication is it, it brings you down. And, you know, it, it's, it, it's not part of it. You know, it's not part of it, you know, at least in my path that I followed. Um, uh these principles, just like, you know, the, you know, the principles that we follow, they're called regulative principles of freedom. Mm -hmm. And it's funny too, because when I first went to like ashrams and I heard this term regulative principles of freedom, I actually laughed because to me, being free meant you just do whatever you want. Like, you know, you don't follow regulations. It seemed to me that regulations was the opposite of freedom, mm -hmm. right? Because freedom means I can just do and say and smoke and, you know, have sex with whoever and whatever and whatever I want to do and whatever, uh, right. you know, I'm just going to indulge in it all. Mm -hmm. And that's freedom, but that's not freedom. 
freedom means that you overcome your lower nature where you can actually make decisions that are based on what's uh, on what's going to be spiritually that's going to involve you spiritually so things like absolutely you know when, when i heard regular principles of freedom i even asked an ashram i was like what are those principles and they said rising early taking cold showers absolutely no intoxication not even any caffeine absolutely no meat eating no meat fish or, or even eggs and you know you have to you know doing yoga every day doing service every day um living simply you know and it went on and on and i was like this doesn't sound like freedom to me this sounds like constriction and just a bunch of rules mm -hmm. and he said that's what you don't understand by following these you know these restrictions your mind will actually become more free and you'll move into a place where you can choose where you can choose things that actually have benefit to your life you know so, an, so an alcoholic has the freedom to choose to you know to choose to drink beer but does he does he even have freedom he's so um you know he's so caught up in his senses and his, and his lower nature and his addictions that he's actually ruled by his lower nature you know what i mean we're trying to get out of that place where you can have such a you know your mind can be so still and so peaceful and you can be so guided by your intelligence that before you make any decision you put it under that metric of what's going to what's going to involve me spiritually and, you know, I've even gotten in, in arguments with people that, you know, will say meat eating is healthy, you know, eating, you know, there's certain types of meat that you can eat that's going to be healthy for you. And it has this, it has this really kind of good, good kind of proteins and things, and things like that. And I was like, you don't understand. I'm guided by a whole different principle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like, it may even be healthy. There may be ways to eat meat and eat lean meats and this and that, where it's actually going to be healthy for you that's not the metric that i that i move navigate the world with my my metric is is this going is this going to evolve me spiritually is this going to make me more connected with krishna and with everybody else and is this going to give me kind of like a, a spiritual vision and a spiritual connection with all living beings and so when i look at do i want to kill an animal for food Regardless of whether that's going to be healthy or not, I don't want to do it because it ruins my spiritual vision that all life is sacred. All life comes from Krishna. And if I want to have that spiritual vision, it's not that I can pet a dog and slice a cow's throat. That's, that's not conducive with that, kind of, with, with, with that kind of philosophy. My philosophy is... Everything does come from God and everything is sacred. So we should, we should treat it in a sacred way. We should treat animals as sacred. We shouldn't kill them and torture them in, in, uh, in slaughterhouses from the time that, that they're born. Where's the compassion in that? Like, yeah. you know, a spiritual principle is you want to start to develop your compassion. So I always put things under the metric of, is that going to involve me spiritually? Is smoking pot going to involve, is, is smoking pot going to involve me spiritually? I don't think so. And it's, 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 it, it hasn't been my experience that the people that I've met in my life that smoke massive amounts of weed are the most spiritually evolved people that I've ever yeah, met. Well, uh, As a matter yeah. of fact, it's, it's been my experience that it's been quite the opposite. You know, is indulging in alcohol going to spiritually involve me? You know, uh, spiritually evolve me? I don't think so. And it's been in my experience that people that indulge in alcohol, their life goes down instead of up. So, yeah, it's a, it's a proven uh, fact, you know. It's a proven fact, you know, that, that uh, you know, people can say that they've got it under control. But, you know, especially, you know, during my worst times in my life, you know, it was definitely the experience of, uh, for me. Um, yeah, it's just, it was a curious question of mine because, um, you know, I read a lot of spiritual texts and i also uh read a lot about kundalini and um i also read a lot uh about the agora uh yogis and their philosophies and their points of life i read a lot about the left hand path and the right hand path and um you know god has two arms you know 
and a thousand arms. And, you know, and so I've always, um, I've always posed the question to a lot of my spiritual friends who like, especially my friends who teach Kundalini and um, they don't really have a take on it. You know, they just are like, well, you know, if that's their spiritual path and that's what the way that they choose, that's their spiritual path. And so it's not really them to be able to judge and, you know, to, uh, to coin a phrase, judge, uh, to, you know, to say whether this is right or this is wrong. It's really all, personal and uh so i was just curious on your take about it so I, I... Well, well well you know that you know when you when you bring up things like kundalini and tantra and things like that uh here's yoga's take on it i can only speak for yoga and my you know my study of of yoga and bhakti yoga here's the yoga take on it it is true everything comes from krishna and in that sense everything is sacred so you could even say that sex is sacred. As a matter of fact, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that sex is sacred. He says yeah. sex according to sex according to Dharma. He says, I am sex according to Dharmic principles. So sex, even something like sex is sacred. So we have this principle, sex is sacred. But and Krishna puts a caveat caveat in there. Sex according to Dharmic principles is is sacred. It's 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 myself. Yeah. So a person could say, okay, sex is sacred. Let me just go out and have just as much sex with as many people as I want, just free, unrestricted, the most debauched sex I can think of. And it's just all sacred. But that's not what, that's not what, according to yoga, that's not what seeing things as sacred means. Yeah, of course not. Seeing, 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 th seeing things as sacred, even like sex is like, okay, sex comes from krishna it's sacred but there's a purpose to it <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. it's like what sex does is first of all you know procreation happens from sex right so you know there, there's this like really you know incredibly beautiful system where you know when two people have sex what it does is that just the nature, the energy of that sexual energy, it binds two people's hearts together. That's just the nature of the energy. When you try to circumvent that and you just try to have like free unrestricted sex with a million different, with a million different people, what ends up happening is that because the nature of sex is to open your heart up to this another, to this other person in this like sacred act that's going to like, bind your hearts together in a loving relationship that's no longer your your mo that's no longer what you're after you're basically just after just you know you know to enjoy the pleasure of sex with as many people as you can and so what you're trying what you have to necessarily have to do is you have to bypass that kind of like heart opening thing that happens between two people and you actually have to end up closing your heart to other people because you just want to have kind of like meaningless sex and you know that meaningless sex it, it ends up you end up getting the exact opposite effect of the natural energy of sexual energy it ends up closing your heart and it makes your heart like hard-hearted because you're not seeing the other person as like a sacred individual that you want to enter into this like sacred loving relationship with. And then you have, and, and then you're ready for like the natural result of the actual sex act to like start a family and have kids and love them. You know, that that's the beauty of sex. You know, you know, when it's according to that Dharmic principle where you're actually developing loving relationships with another person and with, and with the natural byproduct of that, which is kids and right. then it becomes a very beautiful thing. But when you take sex and you put it in like a dark place and, um, you know, you're just out there just for kind of like sense gratification, then it has the exact opposite effect on you. It ends up closing your heart. You end up having just like meaningless relationships with other people based on their bodies, not even based on their spirit. You're not, as a matter of fact, you're not even seeing them as spirit anymore. You're seeing them as bodies. This person's hot. This person's attractive. I want to have sex with this person. This person's fat. I don't care about that person. Like, 
It has the exact opposite of, sp of spiritual evolution. You start to see with a more materialistic vision and your heart becomes more closed. So you just have to kind of like look at what the result of your acts is going to be. It's not that everything is just one and I'm just going to, you know, indulge in every single energy because it's all sacred. You just have to, you know, that's why there's Dharma. That's why there's principles. That's why there's regulations. That's why there's taking a cold, hard look at these things and, uh, and, and thinking, how can I do, how can I, you know, it's not that the activity is bad. But it's how can I do it to spiritually evolve? And, you know, another example is money. Mm. Is money bad? Money is an energy of Krishna, too. Money's not bad. It's not that money is a terrible thing. But when you become very materialistic and you think that this money is going to, you know, the, the amassment of money is going to make me happy. And through kind of like just the act of just like getting money is going to make me happy. You get the exact opposite effect you become a greedy person <laughs> you become greedy you become selfish you yeah, become absolutely. materialistic yep so so it's not that the money is bad but it's the it's the tendency towards greed and materialism that when you interact with that energy of money that energy of krishna in the form of like money then it's going to bring your consciousness down yeah but a yogi you know maybe due to their karma they're just born with a lot of money or they're just a natural businessman and they have that sense where they can just kind of pull money out of the air some people are like that i just happen to not be like that <laughs> but that's not like a bad thing to, to make money but you do it according to you know what dharma says is if you get money in order to protect you from becoming greedy you should think that now that i have money now it's my social responsibility it's my dharmic responsibility to share that with other people and to take care of other people that are in need. And you see these people are like, I know yogis that have millions of dollars and they're deeply spiritual people because they think this money has been handed to me by Krishna to do good work in this world. And money and, and money and money is like that. You can do some amazing things in this world. You can take care of so many people with money. You can start so many amazing projects with money that's going to increase the prosperity and value of so many people and when you see money as like this is an energy it's just a sacred energy of krishna somehow due to my karma krishna has placed this immense responsibility in my hands and i have this i have this massive amount of money let, let me do some good things with this money and that's going to spiritually evolve you it's not the it's not the money is bad and the sex is bad and we're not taking this like kind of christian thing where you know, uh, you know, it's bad and it's evil and says, no, it's, it's Krishna's energy. Use it for Krishna. <laughs> use it to, you know, use it for your own spiritual advancement and, and the spiritual and material advancement of everybody you meet. And when you do that, you become a loving, kind, compassionate. You know, when you do it right, you become a loving, kind, compassionate, selfless person. When you do it wrong, you become a materialistic, greedy, you know, um, selfish person person self-centered person so it's not that we're just gonna like everything's sacred we're just gonna indulge it to it in our heart's content everything's sacred make it sacred by how you use it and use it in, and use it in a good way according to dharma yeah it's really well put and really well explained you know um you know during this time of the pandemic i really changed my whole concept of how like i look at money and how i look at um sex and uh, because of the social distancing and everything, um, I've been celibate since January. And I made the decision that I want to uh, have a real relationship before I engage in sex again. And I've changed my uh, whole philosophy about uh, spending money. Um, and I've turned it more to the terms of I spend money for the things that I need instead of the things that I want. And um, because I really started to realize that when I started thinking about what I want in life, I was depressing myself and I was, you know, I was falling down deeper and deeper because I wasn't getting what I want. 
And then I started thinking about, well, what is it that I really need in my life? And what I really found out was, is that I really don't need a lot of stuff. You know, I mean, 90% of the stuff that I have in my apartment, I could just get rid of. And what, what do you need? Like a head of broccoli and a head of cauliflower and a few carrots a week and like a loaf of bread and like clothes on your back and like a roof over your head. Like you really don't need much. Yeah. <laughs> I told a friend of mine the other day um, that, uh, you know, um, I can, I can buy groceries for like here in Europe. It's really easy here in, here in Germany. Um, I can buy groceries for 30 euros per week. And, and she's looking at me like, how, how do you survive? And I said, oh, look at me. I said, you know, I haven't been to the hospital since I was eight years old. The only thing wrong with me is that I got a hernia that I have to get a surgery for. But other than that, I'm strong. I'm healthy. I've never had one symptom of the COVID. You tell me, what do you need all that? You know, what do you, what, why are you spending 250 bucks a week on groceries? What are you buying? I mean, I can survive and I'm healthy, you know? So, um, yeah, thank you for the explanation about that, because uh, I was really curious about how you thought about it and just your views on it. And uh, because, uh, you know, the Kundalini and the Agoras are, it's, it's a really radical way of life. I have a lot of respect for it. And I think it's like uh, anybody who can, anybody who can live 12 years on the Ganges, uh, you know, and uh survive on nothing and just uh rummaging around and trying to figure that shit out um has and, my and you want to know so and, and you want to know something i don't want to come across like i'm being judgmental to those paths i don't know about those paths <laughs> you know and so i don't know about the agoras and the, you know this and that i can only speak from you know i can only speak from you know my tradition and what i've learned just in you know my lifelong study of like yoga and the upanishads and you know, the Vedic literature. Yeah, but the way you explained um, it was good, though. I mean, there was no judgment in it. And so, you know, you, you explained it from your own point of view. And so that's cool. Um, how you know, you one, thing on that I, one thing that I would just like to say, you know, when, when you were thinking about like, you know, because most people, you know, I think most people in the world are thinking along the lines of what do I want? Like, what do I want to get out of life? What do I, you know, and they have that they have that question of of what do I what do I want? You want to know what a much better question is? What can I give? Yeah. If, if people change their question from what do I want to what can I give, they'd be so much happier. Yeah. This you know, is Gan something Gandhi Gandhi has a really great great quote that I really love, and it's sort of like one of those things that it's like. If you were going to boil down every spiritual path and you were going to like encapsulate it into like one saying, this is what Gandhi said. He said, if you want to find yourself, lose yourself in the service of others. And that's really like the, and that's really like the crux of it. You know, sometimes we're just so, um, we're just so kind of like into like, what do I want? And even like, you know, me, 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 we're so kind of like self-centered. And that's actually part of the problem. You know, in yoga, we want to take ourselves out of the center. We want to put Krishna and other people in the center. And when you do that, when you think, you know, I'm just here to give, I'm just here to serve, you know, I'm here to serve Krishna. I want to develop love for Krishna. I want to reflect that reflect that love of Krishna for everybody that I meet. I want to see everybody, even beings, even the planet, even trees. You know, I want to see that all is sacred. Um, you know, I'm only I'm only here in this, you know, on this planet for a few short years. What kind of what kind of contribution can I make? And that's like the real mindset of a yogi. Like, you know, once you once you get that, then life just kind of falls into place for you. When you're always thinking about what I want and how can I get my piece of the pie, life becomes a struggle real fast. Yeah, I can definitely feel that because my whole concept for this podcast has been uh, that I want to give what I can to my friends and to be able to give my time and to be able to give them some kind of a 
uh, platform where they can tell their story, promote their bands, tell about their life, um, you know, hopefully influence other people to, you know, be better people and to not give up. Because, you know, it's, uh, you know, doing a podcast like this, you know, that goes on for two hours or three hours, it doesn't, uh, it's not just a, okay, you do the, you do the recording and it's over. I got, you know, it's the editing, it's, it's time. And so I think about it as this is something that I'm doing for the rest of the world and that's going to stick around and it's going to be here for people to enjoy. And there's always new generations of people that are going to click online and they're going to see this interview with you. They're going to find out about hardcore for the first time. Uh, friends of mine who are in metal bands, friends of mine who are artists, and you know they're going to find out about these people for the first time. And for me, it's just a constant uh, revolving of, of giving. And, um, and, but in that giving too, I always have to kind of step back too. And I've always got to say to myself that like, I've got to take time for me too, because I'm, I'm also important, you know, and I've got sure. to, you know, I've got to remember, you know, remember that. And there's nothing wrong with that too, because, uh, you know, I've listened to a lot of spiritual teachers that, that have also said, you have to sit back and you have to remember that you also do exist and that you also have to love yourself as well, just as much as you're giving and just as much as you're loving everyone else, you have to love yourself as much as well, you know. And, and you can't pour from an empty cup, you know, you exactly. got to fill your own cup first, you know, you yeah. really, it's, it's, it's so true, yeah. you know, self-care, you know, all that stuff, you know, making sure, you know, Take yeah. care of even you know even taking care of yourself physically you know taking care of your body eating right being healthy you know, the yogi's whole take on that is you know the more health and energy that I have the more I'm going to have to give yeah yeah it's all the temple you know it's all strengthening the base of the temple you know it's all yeah. just uh, you know if there's a crack on the wall add a little bit more mortar and you know fill it up so um, how are you doing on time are you stressed I gotta leave pretty soon. <laughs> okay. All right. Hey, I had, I had just one curious question. I know this is probably not, not going to be an easy one to answer so quickly, but um, I know that you're a huge Smiths and Morrissey fan and all this uh, controversy that's going on right now. Um, are you able to, do you have, do you have a personal opinion and are, not, and are you able to set your, to, are you able to separate the controversy from the music and the man, or is the man, the controversy, the music, how, how do you, uh, how do you deal with people coming at you and saying, ah, oh, you know what, you know, because you're, you are a, like one of the poster boys for Morrissey. All right. Somebody Sorry, just recently, a, somebody it's a, it's just a good recently, way for us to go out of this one, you know, so, yeah. So, somebody, somebody just recently asked me about this. And so here's my take on it. I can't stand cancel culture. I fucking I hate it. I, I can't, can't stand, stand it either. Yeah. I can't stand people when people are so, where people look to be offended and they look for the worst in other people. And it's almost like instead of looking for the good in people, people are constantly looking for how people are, are fucking up and how they can kind of like nail them to the wall. And it's, it, it's in, in just the past few years, it seems like, our culture has just been going down that road. And it's, yeah. you know, for, for me, it's just like, you know, you know what? It, there's just some kind of like natural thing in people where they think that they can put other people down. It sort of levels the playing field and brings them up. Um, according to yoga, when you do that, when you're, when you're constantly criticizing people, when you're fault finding, where you're looking for the bad in them, you're overlooking any good that they do. And you're kind of like magnifying, you know, the bad that they do. Not only does that drag them down it also drags you down yeah because, because you're then, just being negative you're just uh you know that's uh that's that's negative energy that you're expending and it's um it's uh you know what i think about it i think about um i think about the words of christ let he who is without sin cast the first stone you know exactly exactly um you know and there's and there's, there's a great analogy from the upanishads um where they take two animals and they contrast them. There's the fly mm -hmm. 
And what does a fly do? A fly always looks for garbage, smelly stuff, trash, and gravitates towards that and sort of relishes in garbage and, and, and trash like that. Mm -hmm. And then you have the honeybee. What does the honeybee do? The honeybee looks for the sweetest part of the sweetest flower mm -hmm. and takes that nectar from flower to flower to flower. Right. So it's like, what do you want? What do you want to be? Do you want to be a fly or do you want to be a honeybee? Do you want to look out into the world and look for all the trash and garbage and trash talk and, you know, kind of um, get a little kick when other people fuck up and think like, oh, how great I found this dirt on this person. Do you feel like a little kind of charge out of that? Or do you want to be like the honeybee that goes around and just and, and, and looks for the good in people? You know, guess what? We're all human. We're all going to have our flaws. We're all going to fuck up. We're all going to make mistakes. That's just part of kind of like trying to navigate through this world. You know, and, and you know, guess what? If you're that type of person that's always trying to like fault find other people and, and wait for them to fuck up, guess what? Your time's coming. Because right. you will undoubtedly fuck up. And because you've created this culture, and you, you know, people are going to turn on you and be like, okay, now it's your turn. You're canceled. Right. You know, you got to give people the benefit. You know, I've, I've personally made a million mistakes in this life. Yeah. You know, and I've always been grateful to people that despite my mistakes, despite my bad qualities, they've seen some good in me and they've encouraged that good in me. And, you know, it, it makes me want to be a better person when there are people that are overly critical, that look for the bad in me, that dredge up things, bad things that I've done 10 years ago, 20 years ago, stuff that I did when I was a stupid ass 17 year old kid. And they bring that up and they throw it in my face. You want to know what that, that's the most discouraging thing that you can do to another person. It just makes them like, you're right. I'm a piece of shit. You know what I mean? So I don't like cancel culture. I don't like fall fighting. I don't like criticism. You know, that doesn't mean that, you know, really what you have to do is you have to lead. You have to lead from a place of love and compassion. And when you lead from a place of love and compassion, you're just like, I have kids. You know, sometimes my kids mess up. That doesn't mean I'm not going to not punish them. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that, you know, there may be a, there, there, I, I may have to like punish them just to like, set them on a the right path but i do that out of love and compassion for my kids i want to see them grow up right you know to be upstanding people you know to be you know outstanding people you know so that so leading with love and compassion and not fault finding and and, and looking for the good in the people that doesn't mean that there may come to a point where some kind of justice has to be meted out. It doesn't mean a person rapes another person. You're just like, I'm going to let it slide because I'm going to look for the good in them. Right. No, you may have to punish them. They may have to go to jail. Um, but, you know, even in that position, you're always like hoping for, you're hoping the best for people. You know, you're, you're leading with love and compassion. I, you know, even though this person may have been punished, I, I, I wish the best for this person. I hope this person turns their life around. As opposed to like cancel culture where it's just like you're looking to tear people down because you get this kind of thrill that you think it's going to make you – you think it's going to bring you up. Yeah. And I just see this in culture and with like – and with like even like the younger generation, I'm just, so, I'm just so over it. So what do I think of Morrissey? I think, I think Morrissey is – he's one of those people – that I listen to his music, especially like, you know, with the Smiths and even with, even with Morrissey, where I'm like, wow, that song just spoke to me in a really big way. Right. And like, he's articulated something that I'm going through so well, I can't even articulate it. And he's articulated exactly what I'm going through in such a poetic, beautiful way. Wow. That's the magic of music. You know, yeah. I've, I've had so many of those magic moments listening to Smith and Morrissey. What am I going to do? Discount the person because he made a few mistakes? And you want to know something? He said, he said time and time and time again, I'm not racist. I'm not racist. I'm not racist. So he wore it. So he, wore, he fucked up. He wore some kind of right wing pin. I don't even like, I don't know the extent of that thing that he did, but you know, like, it doesn't seem like Morrissey has done something that can't be forgiven 
And you know what, Morrissey? The guy's written some some music that has like lit my freaking soul on fire. I'm not going to discount him because he made a few mistakes. I wish the best for the guy. Yeah. I really do. I hope he learns from his mistakes. He seems to be a pretty... Um, he seems to be a pretty thoughtful person, you know, uh, at least his lyrics to me were like when, when I was like a you know, teenager listening to Smiths, those were like some incredibly thoughtful lyrics. I find it hard to believe that Morrissey is just this asshole. I really do. How can that person that wrote all those amazing lyrics be this kind of like thoughtless, callous asshole? I just find it hard to believe. I'm giving the person the benefit of the doubt that, He's actually a good person. He's probably an, in, an introverted person. And when you get all this negative energy, it just makes you want to hide in your shell when you're that kind of person. And so hes it's not like he's standing up for himself. It's not like he's revealing his mind to people. He's just in his shell. And he's just shut down and people are just throwing mud at him. Mm. And I just refuse to do that. I refuse to do that. I, You know, he, he may have made some mistakes. Um. And I'm wishing the guy the best, and I hope he learns from those mistakes, and I hope he keeps on making incredible, you know, thoughtful music. Yeah, and that's really I, well I, said. I hope the best for him. He's 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 made music that has such a that had such an incredible positive impact on my life that I just can't I just can't go there with him, and just I, I, I just can't. I, I just can't chop him down at the knees. I just, I just don't want to do that. Yeah, I have exactly the same opinion as you, and I, I'm, I'm vehemently against cancel culture. And um, a lot of my friends, they just can't understand it, why I'm so vehemently against it. And um, I really don't care because I'm just not going to support it. And um, uh, you, you said it well, you know. And uh, I've made so many mistakes in my life. Right. How am I going to, who am I to cancel anybody else? Yeah. You know if somebody I mean? looked at that, at my life and like literally wrote down everything that I did wrong, it would be, it would be a lexicon. You'd be canceled in a second. In a anybody, second. Would, anybody would be canceled, but because celebrities life is just so in the public eye that when they do it, you know, you know, it becomes this like huge thing where so much negative energy just gets thrown at them. It's just, I find the whole thing just rather sad. <laughs> I, mean, I, you know, I remember, I remember even, you know, in the early nineties, you know, when people tried to cancel Ray and they were like, Oh, well, we saw Ray drinking a glass of wine. He's not fucking straight edge and whatnot. And he even addressed all that uh, cancel culture shit, you know? And it's like, why would you attack somebody that has had such an influence on people's lives and try to ruin somebody? I mean, literally just ruin their, their reputation, their lifestyle, the, everything that they've ever done for people in their entire lives, you know, and I don't know, maybe Ray did drink a glass of wine. Who fucking cares? You know, and it's like, is it well, really yeah, so fucking well, you important? Know, you know, you know, here, here's the thing about that. Um, it wasn't his, I'm sure it wasn't his finest hour. You know, I'm sure if he could go back and do it, he probably would have done it differently or whatever. But you know what? People mess up. <laughs> right. You got it. You got to give people that room or, you know, we're kind of navigating a crazy world and we're just kind of thrown into this world. We don't always do the right things. We're, we're, we're trying to figure it out, you know, and when you're trying to figure it out, you make mistakes and you learn from you know, that's really what life is all about. You make mistakes, you learn from them, you come to a higher place, you may make more mistakes. And it's just that, you know, that's part of the whole process of coming to a higher place. Yeah. It's not like we're all born pure devotees and, you know, we never mess up and we're kind of like we walk, you know, a foot off the ground. We're so enlightened. Like none of us are like that. Mm. And I've, I've had people in my life. You know, especially like when you're a person like me and Ray, where we took such a hard stance on like, you know, straight edge and this and that. Um, I've had people in my life that have like, they're just looking for the opportunity for me to mess up so they can say, I knew it. I yeah. knew it. Yeah. Mr. Straight edge. I knew it. Look at him now. Off yeah. of his free pedestal. You know, 
there's, there's been, I've been surrounded by people like that. And I've also been, I've uh, luckily I've surrounded myself with people who kind of see the best in me and whatever kind of like little spark of goodness they see in me, they fan that spark and they're always encouraging me. They're always, um, you know, they see the good in me. They, they encourage me sometimes I've had people in, in points in my life where they see good in me that I can't even see in myself. Right. And I'm the you same know, way. You, yeah. You know, when you're just in a bad place in your life and, and you can't even see good in yourself, there are people that come along and they see good in you. And it's so, I tell you, the people that are trying to constantly drag you down, it's so discouraging. And the yeah. people that are, that, are, that are picking you up and even when you fall, they're there to offer you a hand to pick you up. That's encouraging. What are we trying to do here? Are we trying to lift people up? Or are we trying to smash people down? It's just, it just, you know, it just shows like a spiritual bankruptcy in our culture, which is just so ugly. God damn it. I can't stand it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is a perfect place uh, to uh, let you go because obviously you've got to go. Um, stick around just for a second after I turn this thing off. Um, John Paranamba, uh, uh, Paramananda uh, Das. Uh, you got it. Uh, Mr. John Porcelli. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to do this for me. And uh, I, uh, I'm, you know, from the heart, thank you very, very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, there it was, uh, number uh, five uh, with John Porcelli. And so stay tuned. There's more to come.